Good evening, everybody. It is Monday, May 8th, and we are at a regularly scheduled meeting of the Finance Committee. At the beginning of the meeting, I'm joined by Councillor Humphrey from Ward 5, Councillor Gentile from Ward 4, Councillor Kalis from Ward 8, and Councillor Maliki from Ward 3. We have a really sizable agenda tonight. I'm sure everybody can see that. And we're going to have pretty sizable agendas, I think, from now through the end of the fiscal year. I'm just going to march right down it and um, really appreciate everybody's patience in advance as we wait to get to your item. So let's start with number 161-23, acceptance of the $2,500 grant from the Mass Cultural Council. Um, Ms. Gannon, I see you've joined us. Are you going to tell us about this today? Yes, I'd be happy to. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if I can't tell if Commissioner Banks is on or not. She was trying to join us, but yes, I did see her. I think she would. Oh, there she is. <laughs> do you want uh, should Commissioner Banks kick us off or do you want to kick us off? I, I think Commissioner to... wanted to. Yeah. All right, go for it. I'd welcome. love to thank uh, you. welcome us, and, and Paula will do the heavy lifting here, but uh, thank you, Chair Grossman and Finance Commission for having us here this evening. Um, I'm Nicole Banks, Commissioner of Parks, Recreation, and Culture, and I'm joined by Paula Gannon, our Director of Cultural Development. Uh, Paula is going to give a summary tonight of the grant funding that has been received by her and her team. Um, but I just wanted to share that we're so grateful to have the support of the Massachusetts Cultural Council and from the City Council in supporting our arts initiatives here in the city. Um, we really need the resources and um, we will put them to good use. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and good evening, everyone. Um, so this item is, as Commissioner said, from the Mass Cultural Council. Newton is a local cultural council under the state. Every city and town in the state of Mass has a cultural council. And this is their annual festival grant. We actually have received this in the past. This year, it's very exciting because they increased it substantially. They used to be $500 grants. And this year, the state increased that to $2,500. Um, we wrote this grant specifically for the event happening this weekend, which is Family Fun Fest, which is going to be held at City Hall. Um, you always can spot it in the spring because the carnival comes to town. But what I've done this year and in previous years is add a lot of arts components to it so I can tie it into the Mass Cultural Council and receive this funding from them from the arts perspective. So this year our theme is shine. It's all about the youth in Newton, how they shine. We'll be having a public art exhibition. We have contracted with six students from Newton, two middle schoolers, four high schools. They have been working for the past month so diligently painting these remarkable mural boards. You're going to be astonished when you see how great these are. They're gonna be placed in our parks during the summer. The kids will be finishing them up on Saturday on site for the public to engage with and see the work that they're doing and for the youth to have a chance to talk about the meaning um, of art in their world. Along with that, I'm also putting up a live performance stage on Saturday. So we're going to be having from um, 11 till 4 live performances right there at City Hall, all from the new, Newton Youth um, providing our entertainment. Um, that along with the carnival and about 25 vendor booths, it's going to be a really hopping day. So, and it's supposed to be 77 and sunny. So we're really excited. And um, the funding that we did receive through this grant will go to pay the performers. I'm giving a stipend to the artists. And I'm also able to purchase some tickets for the evening performance of Pirates of Penzance, which is being run at the War Memorial Auditorium by the group Commonwealth Lyric Theater. They have an all youth production of the opera. And through our program, Newton Arts Pass, I was able to purchase 30 tickets with this money from the Mass Cultural Council to turn back over to the community for those in financial need who can't otherwise afford to buy a ticket to a show like that. So um, it's a pretty compact day um, with a lot of arts and culture. I hope you'll come out and join us. Wow, that is that is <laughs> quite um, a series of events and cultural opportunities. That's really great. 
let me see if there are comments or questions from counselors on the committee. Do we have any? Councilor Malachy. Tell me again when Pirates of Penzance is. I really want to see that. Oh, fantastic. There's two performances, Councilor Malachy. There's going to be Saturday evening at 7 p.m. and then again on Sunday at 5 o'clock. This coming weekend? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. And you can find all that information on my webpage, which is newtonma.gov slash culture. <laughs> Okay. Do and we also, have any? Other... I would encourage all of you to, um, if you're on social media, I've been pushing that out on my Facebook page and Instagram. If you're on social and you don't already follow me, you really should. There's a ton of great information on there. Um, it's Newton Cultural Development. Just search for that and please follow along. We've got lots of fun stuff happening this season. Awesome. Do we have other comments, questions? or a motion on this item? I'll move approval. Okay, motion to approve by Councilor Kalis. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, I believe we're four to zero. Um, okay, let's go to the next item, which is 162-23, acceptance of $15,830 in grant funding from the Mass Cultural Council. Uh, Commissioner Banks, do you want to start this one again? or? Here, just so you know, there's five of us. Oh, there's five of us. Who did I miss? Who joined that I didn't acknowledge? Or did I, I acknowledge and just counted wrong? You, you did acknowledge all. I, I okay. Believe. All right. Very good. Then I just counted wrong. Um, Commissioner Banks, do you want to start this one off? Thank you. I'll pass it right to Paula. I can't wait to hear more about it. Okay. <laughs> it's all very exciting. <laughs> Great. Thank you so Thanks. much again. Um, so again, this grant also is from the Mass Cultural Council. However, unlike the previous, this is a one-time grant. This was their ARPA funding. And we had an opportunity. Um, they, they came out with two offerings, one for organizations, one for individuals in arts and culture. So we just latched onto that and applied as an organization. Um, these are unrestricted funds and the grants ran from 5,000 to 75,000. You didn't request an amount, you just submitted an application and they determined through your budget, through your financials, um, what you would qualify for. So I was really pleased to get this $15,000. This is a pretty significant sum for us to get from the Cultural Council. I'm really happy with that. And um, the purpose of this really was to help us to reset after COVID. I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you the severity that the pandemic had on the arts community. You know, our performing arts completely stopped. We shifted quite quickly to visual arts and we've maintained that as a focus now. We're doing a lot. Um, if you've been walking through City Hall, I think you've seen the gallery spaces that have been activated again, the community gallery and the mayor's gallery upstairs. I recently installed a student gallery in the stairway. So the visual arts are really, really um, still important to us. And I'm hoping that with some of these funds, I'm gonna be putting in some additional lighting on the second floor floor gallery, there really is none right now for the fine art that's up there in the mayor's gallery. That will really help us. Um, the other are our programs, which suffered significantly during COVID. We basically shut down our toddler art and music program. It's still not back to where it was pre-pandemic. So some of this funding will help to market that program a little bit more widely. It'll help me to pay for the staffing in that program because the staffing's paid by the registrations and the registrations are just <coughs> not up to where they were pre-pandemic. So there's a lot of needs to help us reset after the pandemic and this 15,000 will go a long way to do that. Hey, thank you very much. Really appreciate that overview and certainly understand the need. And it is a really nice sum of money uh, to help out with that purpose. Do we have comments, questions? Uh, and Councilor Malik, your hand is still up, but I don't know if that was from before, if you have a comment on this one. No, okay. Um, pretty straightforward, obviously. Do we, um, do we have a motion on this item? I'll move it. 
Okay, motion to approve by Councillor Malachy. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is a five to zero vote. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. Great. And uh, th that concludes your items for tonight. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much right. for joining Thank us. Thank you all. Thank you all. all right. Have a good evening. Good you night, too. Everyone. We're going to go on to 156-23, Her Honor the Mayor requesting authorization to transfer $1.5 million to improve the city's roadways, sidewalks, and ramps. Uh, and I believe we have Deputy Commissioner Sullivan here to talk about that tonight. You do. You. Thank you. So this transfer will bring us to our $9.5 million for FY23 in spending for the Transportation Network Improvement Program. It will allow us to continue to raise the PCI of our roadways, improve our sidewalks, and our ADA ramps. Happy to take any questions. Okay, so in the letter, um, you talked about this being savings from attrition, this particular transfer. Oh, and Ms. Lemieux, I see your hand is up. Maybe you wanna shed some light on this. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Um, we, the city of Newton, I think we may have put it in this letter, but I know you've all heard this throughout the course of the year. We have certainly not been immune from um, the labor shortages that have been felt perhaps across the entire country, certainly in the Northeast. Um, the Public Works Department has been uh, one of our departments that has been particularly hard hit. Uh, we have had times during the year when we have had as many as 50 vacancies across the department. We have about a total of 200 employees. So we've had as high as a 25% vacancy rate. Um, so a lot of the work that we would have had um, happening during the course of the year, whether it would have been sidewalks or whatever else, you know, our internal employees might have done, uh, could not get done. And so as we have done in several other years, uh, we're here looking to take that attrition money and put it into um, the paving lines where we will hire contractors to do work uh, that we otherwise were not able to finish. So one and a half million dollars is a lot of attrition. How many human beings are we talking about? At well, one point, that, that, um, 55 employees. We are right now sitting at 44, but that's recently. So yeah. for most of the year, we were more than a quarter down in employees. Where is the bulk of that um, type of employee? Unfortunately, our utilities and our streets divisions, they're, they're um, the mechanics, oh, also fleet, we're short several mechanics. Um, it's mostly our labor force, unfortunately. So it sounds like you were making progress if you've reduced the number of vacancies. How yeah, have you been getting been. by in the meantime, being down 44 to 55 people? It's been difficult, but we're managing. Um, and if I could ask a little more, what is the plan to address the shortage or... So we've been uh, yeah. working with HR to develop great flyers. We've been going to job fairs at high schools and trade shows. So, and we've also gotten, I think three or four candidates through this. We've been working with our vendors. If anyone's laying anybody off to suggest that they may want to apply here. So we are working on it and it seems to be working somewhat. How much of the problem is what we pay or offer in benefits? We did a we updated our study, our wage study. We're right in the middle in most cases. So it isn't that. It is just attracting applicants. I, I guess it makes sense to me that if we're in line with other communities, but obviously folks who are in this profession must be opting to go elsewhere. Um, and this will be OIC of your hand up. So feel free to add if you want. Uh, thank you, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, when we renegotiated the Teamster contract 
and the foreman's contract after that, as, as uh, the deputy said, we really took a hard look. The Teamsters contract in particular, we really increased um, the lowest end of that union so that people would come in making, um, making really making a decent wage. Um, we, we did a study, we made sure that we were well within um, you know, at least the top half um, on on those different types of jobs. However, at things like mechanics, we cannot possibly compete with what the private sector um, pays for mechanics on heavy duty equipment. The problem that we've had this year, not only can we, can we not compete with our mechanics, even the mechanic or auto bodies or um, mechanic shops can't hire people. So it almost, um, it's just such a trickle down. We can't even send our equipment out to get fixed. And we have different uh, vendors who were not even allowing the city to order new, new vehicles. So it's just so that that segment of the industry has been particularly hard hit. Um, and again, as the, as the deputy said, our laborers, um, you know, we've really seen a shortage there. I would say that we, even though we're going to come to you, we, we um, docketed an item. I don't know if we stamped it in yet today, but I think you all probably saw it in that list of all the docket items that we have before you, those 24 docket items that we've put before you over this last week or two. Uh, we will need some more money for snow and ice, but I will say to you, we were really fortunate that this year was a mild winter because we had so many vacancies in DPW and, and our contractors were dealing again with the same thing. So even our contractors who do our plowing um, have been experiencing uh, the same labor shortages. So it's just, it's a phenomenon that, um, the, you know, I think, I think our wages are in line, certainly with what other communities are paying. But as I said, not, you know, the mechanics, we can't even touch what mechanics make in the uh, private sector. Um, thank you. Next question is with this one and a half million, what will that take us to total for transportation network improvements funding? And then along with that, uh, I know the mayor alluded in her budget address to some of the major roadway improvements you're planning to take on, but could you briefly go over what you expect the highlights of the uh, improvement season to bring? Ward and Waverly will be paved this year, or portion of Ward, all of Waverly, sidewalks done as well as along with ADA ramps. We'll be doing the Comab carriageway from Beaumont, Beaumont Ave all the way down to, I believe right before Ash Street. We'll be doing a number, I think we're at 44 neighborhood roads this year. When do you think Ward and Waverly are gonna get started? I'm obviously particularly excited about that. As soon as they're off, we'll work with um, MWRA to pay Ward and a portion of Waverly. We are going to, I believe, continue with the contractor that they're using to complete Waverly. So I would say September would be my guess. Okay. Um, and then in terms of total funding for the transportation network improvement program this year, where are we at? And um, Ms. Lemieux maybe, or, or uh, Ms. Sullivan, uh, transfer, how we're putting the money together this year. This transfer brings us to the 9.5 for FY23. Okay. So I know essentially every year we still have to look for the one and a half million. And this is essentially that. Right. Okay. Um, who has further, oh, I just raised my own hand. Who has further comments or questions? <laughs> Councillor Malachy. Um, so with the, um, everyone seems short on labor. Is that not also true in the people who are doing the, the contractors who are doing the work? And is this the best time to be trying to do that work? So uh, I'll be happy to jump in um, and then obviously our deputy can um, supplement whatever I say. Uh, certainly some of the contractors have issues also, but um, you know, they bid on these projects and, and they plan on getting them done no matter what. We have some very good contractors who we work with, who we have been very pleased with. 
over um, the past five years. We have others who have come in and done, you know, a job or two for us or, or have received a, a really good contract from us, a big contract. And the ones that don't perform as well, we don't hire again. Um, so, you know, I think we probably, because we're in a position where we have such a strong uh, network improvement transportation improvement program each year, uh, these contractors know that we are going out uh, to bid and we are going to be spending a lot of money on our roadways and we get out early. A lot of these surrounding communities can't put their bids out until they receive their chapter 90 money, which is the state trend, um, roadway money. Because we have been so aggressive in how we've been funding this, um, we get out to bid pretty early uh, once we establish our per unit costs, then what we end up doing is extending those contracts as we cobble these funds together over the course of the fiscal year, we're able to ex um, extend our per unit costs. What, what do you mean by extend per unit cost? So when we bid um, these contracts out, so if we're bidding out a paving job, we bid it by the linear foot and um, I think, right, Shauna, linear foot? Materials and linear foot. Yeah. And so um, if a contractor, whoever bids the lowest amount per linear foot, then as long as we're not adding um, unit value cost to the bid, we can, ex we can, we can add more money to the uh, bid package or the award, um, as long as it stays at the unit cost. So we've already bid it out. We already know that we got the best unit cost um, per linear foot. And um, so as we as we add amounts to our um, to our paving uh, fund each year, uh, we are more often than not able to go back to those contractors who were most aggressive um, back in February when we bid this out when we were ready to roll before lots of other communities were. It's so, actually worked out quite well for us. So if you get, if you get a, um, agree on a contract at a certain cost per linear foot and you add more work during the calendar year, fiscal year, whatever, then you're guaranteed the same price? Yes. For if, that if they don't honor, If they don't honor the same price, we would have to go out to bid again. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. All right, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Malachy. Councillor Gentile. So I just wanted to respond for a minute to <clears throat> Council Malachy's question. I mean, I think that it's a good question and Council Malachy, part of the answer is, is that um, if we wait, there are no signs that things are gonna get better and are gonna get less expensive. That's the problem. If we thought that uh, the labor market was going to change, then you know maybe we would um, slow down some of these projects and hope that the pricing gets a little bit more in line, but there is nothing that indicates that that's happening right now. And then the only other um, comment that I would make not so much on this particular type of work, but I would hope that if there were some other project or similar project where the numbers just came in crazy, that we would have the discipline to just say, you know what, good luck to you and the rest of the folks. We're not going to bite right now, and maybe we might have to delay some stuff. But that's what it's getting to, is that the numbers... Um, are just so crazy right now that, you know, you may have to not do something um, as quickly as you want. Uh, Ms. Lemieux, did you want to respond to that? Thank you. If I may, I'd be happy to, um, because we actually are, um, thank you, uh, Councilor Gentile, for even bringing that up. Um, I, I think we are very disciplined when it comes to that uh, one one project. In fact, that I can think of that we've just recently decided that we um, that there's no way we could afford how the bids came in, and we're going to try to rebid it. I think sometime this summer, and that's the dredging the city hall ponds. Um, when we did it several years ago, it was I want to say probably a four hundred thousand dollar project. It came in this time and 
help me, Sean, or I think it was two and a half million that the bids came in. 2.8? It's, you know, it's it's crazy what's happening out there. And so we absolutely walk away from projects um, if they're too expensive. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, is there a motion I'll, on the side of I'll this? move it. Motion to approve by Councilor Gentile. Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so we're six to zero now. Councillor Oliver has joined us as well. Um, all right, we're gonna go on to the next item. And this is 157-23. For honor the mayor requesting authorization to appropriate a million dollars from free cash to DPW's vehicle equipment account. Deputy Commissioner, do you wanna speak about this one? Absolutely. So the $1 million will be used to replace six vehicles. They are two street sweepers in sustainable materials, a utility truck for the traffic division, two asphalt rollers and a backhoe for the streets division, and a work van for the public buildings department. These vehicles are all at the end of their useful life. They're all between nine and 14 years old. The Newer ones, the nine-year-old ones, are our sweepers. Recommended, recommended replacement is at six years. So these are three years beyond their useful life. These purchases are also in line with our vehicle replacement plan. Happy to take questions. Can you just go over the rest of the vehicles and where they're at with respect to their useful life? So the remainder of them um, are 2000, two 2009 vehicles, a 2011 vehicle. The asphalt rollers, I believe, are both 2012 vehicles. Um, the rollers are used all summer long in all of our construction, so they don't have a lengthy life. The van is used throughout snow, all of our everyday delivering signs with our traffic division, painting lines, hauling equipment, um, and the work van for the public buildings department is obviously used on a daily basis. I believe that's the oldest at 2009. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lemieux, did you want to comment? Thank you. Just from a financial perspective, uh, the reason that you see, you see us using free cash on this item, um, they would have these, this list of vehicles would have initially been in the CIP and it would have been our expectation that we probably would have bonded these. Um, but because we had such a large free cash certification this year, and because um, the budget has been so tight on, this is exactly the type of item that we have used free cash for, particularly when it comes to vehicles, because we never bond a vehicle for more than 10 years. And so we, we more or less get the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to freeing up capacity within the operating budget to use our items um, that would have otherwise been bonded. Um, it frees up more money, if you will, for the same million dollars than a 20 year project might have done um, when it's a 10 year item. So, so there, the, there was really, you know, a win-win, uh, if you will, uh, from a financial perspective on this. Ms. Lemieux, what's the ten-year borrowing rate right now? Say, um, I, I don't know, but it's about when we do our bonds. Um, within our bond sale, we have all different terms. Um, so, and then what we calculate is the true interest cost for the entire bond sale. So I don't know what the coupon rates are right now. What I can tell you is for our bond sale that we did in January, um, we received a true interest cost of 2.93%. But that covers borrowing of all different types of terms. Exactly. Exactly. 2.93? 2.93, I believe. Okay. Um, Councillor Gentile, let me go to you. So unfortunately, I think that that rate is going to be significantly higher today. Um, now that we're uh, into May, 
and the rates have done nothing but steadily climb. But anyway, I raised my hand because um, I don't quarrel with the need. I don't quarrel with the specific vehicles or, you know, how old they are. But I will say this. Um, the president, and I don't know, maybe, um, Madam Chair, you might have signed on to this letter, but we sent a letter to the administration um, a few weeks ago asking for more information about the plan on how we were going to spend on, uh, free cash. And, and I actually thought um, that it was an excellent letter and raised some very legitimate points. So I'm reluctant. It's not the it's not what's being asked, but I'm reluctant right now to approve any more uh, free cash because we just keep, you know, we had this one time um, bonus, you know, of twenty five and a half million dollars. Last I asked, we were down to twenty three. I'm not sure where we're at right now, but I think that we should give consideration to waiting until we hear back from the administration to see what the big plan is. So um, I could be convinced otherwise, but I don't plan on supporting this right now. It has nothing to do with my questioning the ass from the uh, Public Works Department but I just think that, you know, we asked a very legitimate question and we should have a discussion about where we're going with all this free cash before we spend any more. So, so Councilor Gentile, I did, I did sign on to that letter and you're describing my feelings exactly right now. Um, uh, Ms. Lemieux, I'll come to you in a second. I see you're, you're ready to speak. I'm also struggling a little bit with how to deal with it. I mean, at the time, uh, part of the reason we referred those first two really large free cash items to the committee of the whole was because all this, all these moving parts felt like a really large financial pretzel to me. And given their large impact and all the moving parts of the budget that we're about to evaluate, I really felt like we should be able to look at them all together rather than be asked to just approve this here and approve that there. Then we kind of ended up in a situation, well, not kind of, we did, where we've got now 24 different items that we have to handle between now and the end of the month. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to put it on this agenda because I'm also wary of trying to plan out between now and June and make sure we can hear everything and get through our work. So I certainly am open to not approving this tonight and thinking about other ways to do this. Um, we've got some big budget questions coming up before us that we're going to have to wrestle with. So I'll stop there for now and, and also listen to what other people have to say. But Ms. Lemieux, let me go to you and then Councillor Kalis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and as I think you know, um, I had hoped that at, it was it last Wednesday, um, at the Committee of the Whole meeting, I had um, great hopes that we were going to get to the second docket item. Um, I believe it is on the agenda for this coming Wednesday. Uh, as long as we get there, we are absolutely prepared and anxious to talk about the entire plan, which is why I actually put that. Um, uh, a spreadsheet together that has the 24 docket items. We will now, today we docketed the last four items that say to be docketed on that list. Anything that we intend to um, look for free cash for is, is on that list. At this point, we'll be more than happy to discuss it holistically as long as soon as there's a point in some agenda, um, you know, where we have the opportunity to do that. But um, you know, it's, I know it, it seems disjointed, dis, uh, God, what is the word? Disjointed. disjointed. Thank you. <laughs> disjointed. Um, uh, 
it seems disjointed, but it's not. There really is a holistic plan. And as I say, we, we will be more than happy because we had so many moving pieces this year. But that's that um, spreadsheet that has the 24 items, I would say is really, um, you know, I hope that you all use it as more or less a key, if you will, um, to everything, you know, to what it really looks like that we'll be asking you to consider over the next um, eight weeks, seven or eight weeks, whatever's left. Um, okay, let me take Ms. Sullivan and then it, Councilor Kalis uh, and come in. Madam Chair, can I thing? just make one more comment? Um, sure. This item, what I tried, the other thing I tried to do on this spreadsheet, and uh, what, which item number is this? 15723. Um, I tried to take a look at all of these requests that are in front of you. And so something like this request, um, when I put for a date when, when we would require it back, um, I put early June for all of these different things, just so that you as a finance committee realize um, we have to, if we are going to use free cash at all, uh, it has to be appropriated from the full board uh, before the end of the fiscal year. So your last meeting in June, I wanna say is June 19th, uh, but I could be wrong on that date. But anything that, any, anything that we're asking to use free cash for has to be approved by that date. And it's because free cash, we are actually appropriating free cash, whereas we can still come in if we need money and transfer it from unexpended appropriations, but we can't use free cash. Um, beyond that point. And so on this spreadsheet, you'll see there are several items that I put June 15th as the date that we would need it because they need to really be um, dealt with uh, for up or down um, in the same time frame where you would have to be dealing with the budget. And then there are others that I put um, early June and then you will see there are some, and I really tried to minimize the ones um, that need to be approved in mid in uh, May, so the more the uh, more critical ones, you know, I've certainly put May as them, but I, I tried to really spread it out and be as realistic as I could be in um, you know how we were looking at the dates. Right. So this and one, as I, I look I, at the dates, so we'd probably have full council on the fifth, this committee on the twelfth, Juneteenth is the nineteenth, so I assume we and the, oh, the clerk sorry. is nodding along. So the twentieth would be full council. Twenty yep. sixth would be finance, but by then we have no full council meeting after that. Exactly. So, so we're really, so for June many, 12th. many, right? So many of these items, uh, if finance, um, you know, finally votes them out on the twelfth, and they get to the full council on the twentieth, um, we will be fine. So I, I don't want people to think, even though there's a tremendous amount of, of docket items that will be before you, um, I, do, I did not want you to think that we were looking for you to rush them all through, um, it, it, which is exactly why I put the sheet together the way that I did. Okay, um, thank you. Let me go to Deputy Commissioner Sullivan, then Councilor Kalis, then I'll come back to you, Councilor Gentile. There's some time sensitivity to this. We have um, we only have a certain time span to place an order due to supply chain demands. So if we don't get it in, it can delay vehicles by a year or two. We keep coming across this. Do you have a particular cutoff date that you know of, or it's just a slippery slope situation? It's a, it's a really slippery slope. We've had wrecks in and they've canceled them. Okay, um, Councillor Kalis and Jen. That's exactly what I was going to ask the Deputy Chief there, or Commissioner. Um, I I do agree with um, Councillor Gentile and and what you said, Councillor Grossman. I'd like to see it all together, um, but now that I heard what Ms. Sullivan said, I'm willing to go ahead with this because I I think in the end we're going to anyway, and. Um, uh, I appreciate what um, Ms. Lemieux has said and putting together the, the, the whole spreadsheet. I think we'll be able to look at that on Wednesday and um, and have the full picture there. But on this one, I would go ahead. Councilor Gentile. 
I, I guess that um, I, I was prepared to say that I was going to ask for hold um, based on um, what we heard from Ms. Lemieux, uh, because I think that we can do what we have to do. And I never want to upset the uh, assistant commissioner, vice commissioner, who helped me for years get through all this stuff. So I don't want to upset her, but um, I would prefer that we move quickly, take all this up and, um, you know, get it out by the date that uh, Maureen has said, as long as it sounds like we get this to the full council at our second meeting in June, it sounds like it, should work. I understand that there might be a contract or two that I guess a week, a couple of weeks could make a difference, but I would prefer to do that. Um, but I'd be interested in what others think. I'm with you, Councillor Gentile. Councillor Kalis. Look, I, I, I agree with you, Councillor Gentile, but your operative word was should. And we're talking about the city council here where we have 24 members and there's no guarantee we're even going to get to that list uh, at the Committee of the Whole on on Wednesday, uh, which would push that. It's just, I, I just think there's too much risk. And um, and, and so, so I, yeah, I, I'm ready to move it. Um, can I respond to that? Sure. Um, it's a good point. And uh, Council Kalis, if we don't do our job, and get to it, you know, the way that we've been told that we really need to get to it, then I guess I'd be a lot more ready to, you know, to vote it. But, um, you know, we can move quickly if we want. And I think that that's, you know, what we should do. But as, as you're correct in saying, um, you know, there's a lot in front of us, and that doesn't always happen. But I, for one, would, if we haven't resolved it, then I, for one, would say this is one item that should go through. I'd just like to see us look at the whole package and get one shot at it. Uh, I just procedurally want to explain the, some difficulty to everybody that I haven't quite sorted out. And Madam Clerk, feel free to jump in if I kind of misspeak or misdescribe any of this. So we've got a committee of the whole on Wednesday night with the same docket items essentially that we had before us at our 8 a.m. meeting last week. Um, my hope right now is to spend an hour on the COLA docket item and the remaining time discussing uh, the free cash items as well as what I'll call the catch-all item, which we wrote to make sure we could discuss all this other stuff. Um, but all those other items are also now separate docket items that have to come through finance. And I just wanna make sure Madam Clerk that we're doing everything um, you know, as cleanly and as quote unquote kosher as possible in sort of what we're talking about. I mean, there's no way on next Wednesday night we're gonna be talking about 24 whole items. I think more holistically, we are in a position to talk about how much free cash, the topic of the, um, of, the, of any other surplus funds that may be sort of uncertified out there. But I just kind of want to turn to you for a second because we're starting to get into some difficult procedural stuff that I have not yet wrapped my head around fully, if you want to say. Yes, and well, the items on the 10th on Wednesday, the Committee of the Whole, those have only been referred to the Committee of the Whole, so they don't go back to finance. If, right, unless okay. unless we were to, you know, vote them unless, back to the council and refer them back out to finance. Yes, so. Um, Which I don't think in this, with these few items, I don't think adds a ton of value, but maybe people will disagree. Right, depending on the committee um, wishes. I think realistically on the 10th, if you have an hour for the COLA discussion and then discuss the docket item that has kind of the overarching conversation about free cash. And then hopefully maybe after that, there'll be a better guidance as to how to vote the other free cash items. 
moving forward. But there will, this month is very tight with meetings. So to have another committee of the whole, I, I'm looking at the budget calendar now, if we had to hold those items again or partial parts of that agenda, we could maybe have it on the 24th, which is another Wednesday, but it's after your second finance meeting. So it, it will be tight if, I, I don't know if all items will be decided upon tomorrow night, I mean, Wednesday night. I feel like that's gonna be a long discussion. I, so I, if I understand, uh, I, I'm not, has anybody made a motion or consider themselves to have made a motion at this point? Councillor Kalis? I'm making a motion to approve. Okay. Uh, discussion on the motion to approve. Any further comments and questions? Councillor Gentile. Uh, I'm going to vote against the motion only because I think that we should hold it uh, in the hopes that we can, uh, you know, have this greater discussion and get this thing voted out um, in the middle of June. So I'm going to vote against. I prefer not to vote against it, but I got no choice. I prefer I was considering to an abstention myself. Um, with reserving the right to vote against it uh, in the full council, but I am also not going to vote to approve this right now. Uh, any other discussion? Okay. Um, Councillor Oliver? Yeah, terribly sorry there. Um, so I was transferring from the car to the home audio here. Are we on and are we on 15623? Sorry, I forget Sorry. the number. 157. I know the top. No, 157. What? 150. Okay, my fault. All right. So we're still on the vehicle equipment. Okay. Thank we you. We are. And and uh in terms of the you know the 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 kind of procedural uh situation here, uh I'm leaning towards abstaining uh myself. I think that seeing the full picture is worthwhile. Uh, I believe that um, as a uh, council, we owe it to ourselves to have that look. And I believe that as a council, uh, we will also make sure that we get this done. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite sure that no one would want free cash to um, pass us by, if that is the uh, the ultimate possible ultimate negative possibility here, but um, I do appreciate it. I will be um, I, I can't vote to approve this kind of uh, without all of the uh, uh, adjoining information, right? That we that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Just one clarifying point. If we were to not approve this and the fiscal year ended, the free cash wouldn't go away. It would just get locked up for a number of months while Fair we enough. go through the free cash recertification process and the cash would ultimately get rolled forward to the next All fiscal right. year. It just wouldn't be available to us until some point in the fall, usually October-ish. That's correct. Um, right. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Mr. Curley, did you want to say something there? I just said that's correct. So technically, okay. the free cash closes. It closes to undesignated fund balance, which becomes the starting figure for the next year's free cash. So you lose free cash June 30th. You get it back mid-October. But whatever is unspent is part of the starting number for the next year's calculation. Thank you. Councillor Humphrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm in agreement with Councillor Kalis in planning to support his motion. I, I think we've heard a pretty compelling case here that there is a very rapid ticking clock on this particular item with the way that the uh, the vehicle and equipment market is at the moment. And it really could make a pretty significant difference. I'm not confident in our ability to get through this uh, within this week. I'm sorry, but last week's meeting People, there's 24 of us, as was already said, and a lot of people were running out the clock on that meeting, and we did not get through. And but I will say we have the written materials, 
on on the various free cash items. People were free to have looked at that before we had to vote on this. So I don't really see a compelling reason to delay this particular item, which in the grand scheme of things was a relatively small one compared to some of the other ones. Thank you. I'll just say for myself that in addition to whatever we may hear of the Committee of the Whole, I'm not comfortable approving any other money until I hear the school budget and where we're at with um, the positions that are going to go unfilled in the future year. Um, the impacts, particularly on the middle school and kindergarten aides, I just, I'm past a point where I can just say yes and not be thinking personally about my own priorities and trade-offs and where I'm willing to spend um, our, uh, I don't want to say extra dollars, but our dollars. So, so again, I'm going to abstain right now. Um, any other discussion? Otherwise, I'm going to call for a vote. Okay. All those in favor? If uh, I'm going to actually ask you to raise your hands. I want to make sure we're crystal clear on this one. Okay. We have two in favor. Those opposed. and abstentions. Okay, so we have two in favor, no opposed, four abstentions. So that is I, considered, a, oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I was late, I voted, uh, I opposed. You're opposed, okay. Two in favor, one opposed, three abstentions. So technically that is still a referral for an approval, Madam Clerk, right? Okay, um, thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Have a good night. We are going to go on to 160-23. Her Honor, the Mayor requesting authorization to transfer $21,950 for an online code management program. Um, who is going to kick off the discussion on this particular item? I'm not actually clear on that. I can talk about it. I wasn't sure if CFO Lemieux um, had any statement? Uh, no, actually, Madam Chair, I'm more than happy to have um, our clerk um, really take this one on. Okay, Madam Clerk, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair Grossman and committee members. Um, I'll be real quick. I, I mentioned an online code management last year in my budget talks, and I'm happy to be moving forward with this project online code management. It's a web-based hosting of our code and the ability to search, share, and translate our code along with the ability to research other municipalities as well. Uh, this program was reviewed by Council President Albright, Councilors Markowitz, Baker, and Wright, along with uh, Assistant City Solicitor Temple and City uh, Chief Information Officer Mulvey. Um, this program will benefit not just my office when we're updating the code, but uh, city council, the public, any developers will be able to search the code easier. Uh, planning department won't be able uh, will be able to let go of the chapter thirty upgrades that they do right now. ISD and law and others will will benefit from this as well. Um, what it does is it upgrades how we present our city code. It automates updates. Uh, there's a quicker codification product, uh, process, uh, ease of use. Um, legislative research possibilities. You can share pieces of the code and email it directly through that program. Um, the timeline for this, um, when we sign the contract uh, next month, it will be a long process, about seven to eight months. Uh, we will transfer the ordinances. I will work with uh, the online code program. We'll review the transfer and then hopefully by uh, April at the latest, of next year, we'll be training and launching the web page, and I'll have a, a meeting with counselors, a meeting with staff, and we'll go over all the uses and abilities. But I'm happy to take any questions right now. Um, so let me ask you the same questions about attrition that I asked our Department of Public Works. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're not talking about the same volume, but right. obviously, we've had a fair amount of turnover. And um, you know, rapid change in the office. How are you managing it? Uh, what is your, you know, plan for full staffing? And, uh, 
you know, how are you feeling about those same topics that I asked our deputy commissioner earlier? Oh, sure. I mean, there are, are ways we're reviewing uh, workflows. And I, I think I mentioned um, during programs and services in my budget meeting, we talked a lot about turnover and burnout. Um, I'm going to be reviewing the whole new elections process that we're dealing with since last July, uh, looking at ways that we can automate and use technology to benefit our workload, this being one of them, online code management. It's something that um, the assistant clerk of council and myself you will be using frequently um, and other departments hopefully, hopefully will be able to ease up on their workload as well with this. So when it comes to turnover, I mean, it's, it's hard everywhere. I think that's a national uh, issue. Um, I would love to reevaluate. It's been over 10 years since we've kind of researched and evaluated our positions, union and non-union. So I hope to be doing that soon. We do have uh, an, a new assistant clerk of council will be starting on the 15th. I'll be emailing council as well. We have a committee clerk position open and uh, due to FMLA issues, uh, an elections coordinator position open as well that we've just posted. So I hope to have them filled um, in a perfect world. I hope in two months to have a fully staffed office. Uh, but for right now, um, turnover is being reviewed. I, I do believe that the elections is creating more workload for us. So we really need to, I need to keep an eye on that and figure out how we can balance that. Do you feel like we're able to compensate people adequately to compete? Not for some of our positions, no. That's why I need to research other cities and see what's com comparable in, in job title and duties and the salary. Thank you. You're Do welcome. we have other comments or questions? Do we have a motion on this item? I'll move it. Motion to approve by Councillor Gentile. Do we have any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we're six to zero on that item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excuse me one sec while I scroll back up to the top here. Okay. Uh, we are now entering the budget portion of our meeting. And just a reminder that we've, we do at the conclusion of our budget still have two. Where were those uh, yesterday? Oh, Councilor Gentile, I think you might have to mute that. Um, we've got, uh, we, we will still have two items that are just for the committee uh, where a motion for executive session may be entertained at the end of our budget portion. We're gonna do our budget portion first. So, um, these items, which I'm going to put on the table all together, are item 1 23, item 1 23, subparens 3, and item 1 23, subparens 4. They're submittal of the fiscal year 24 to 28 capital improvement plan, municipal and school operating budget, and supplemental capital improvement plan. Um, and questions and comments on all three of those um, will be in order as we review these departments. So the first one that we have uh, is the comptroller's department and then followed by our retirement system. I do see we've been joined by uh, the director of the uh, Newton retirement system as well as several members of the board. So Mr. Curley, I'm gonna go to you first to review your department's budget. Uh, then we'll do the, the retirement piece following that. Uh, then the treasurer's office then purchasing. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, Counselors. Um, Comptroller's office is made up of six full-time and a part-time staff. Um, our job is essentially financial compliance for the city, financial reporting, um, the audit, making sure all state and local reporting is done accurately and on time. Um, we don't have any real exciting things going on this year, which is pretty standard for an accounting office. Um, we do focus on some trainings and I'm happy to report that Stella in our office, Stella is a lotion of the deputy comptroller, passed her certified governmental accountant exam um, about maybe a week ago. And 
So that's big news for us. And we do have other trainings going on, which is something that we've always kept a focus on. Um, that's it from that aspect. I can get into the dollars and cents side. So when you look at our budget, it it looks big. Um, Comptroller's budget, it totals $65.4 million. Um, the Comptroller's budget itself is only about 830000 So within the Comptroller's budget, there's a lot of items um, that we oversee largely because of controls. So interfund transfers, there's an item this year, the 1.16 million, that has to do with the transfer to a capital project line for the Horace Mann School. That item is budgeted contingent on the retirement POLA item that is before city council, which would, as a result, reduce the annual appropriation for 24 from 9.6% which was voted back in the February retirement board meeting down to 6.6%. And that would free up the 1.16 million in the general fund operating budget, which the administration is uh, using as an interfund transfer to start kick off the Horace Mann project. Um, we also have the workers comp transfer, which is every year it's $800,000 transfer to the workers comp. We have property insurance under us, property insurance this year, has spiked significantly. Um, we met with our property insurance company, Napshank. They are going out um, working with travelers who is, I um, believe, underwriter is the term. Um, and they've explained how rates have spiked. So our increase went from about $700,000 last year up to $806,000 this year. And that is probably still very tight uh, based off of the values of the properties. And so property insurance is meant to cover the replacement cost of buildings. And as you know, building material and all of that is going up significantly as well as rates for insurance going up significantly. So the two factors that essentially make up property insurance are going up. Um, so you'll see a big spike in that. We also have 3.6 million in reserves under my budget, which are um, snow and ice, which is 1.5 million, it, the regular current year reserve, which is 500,000, and then about $1.6 million in current year wage reserves. Again, those are housed in my department. Those are decisions of the administration. Um, and then if, if you're good with that, I'm sure more time will lead into the retirement. So if we wanna discuss any of that before turning over to the retirement line within my budget, we can do that if you'd like. Uh, why don't we pause for a second and take comments and questions here in your budget. I have one just really quickly looking at your org chart. Um, so, Stella's title is deputy and Regina's title is assistant. And I, I see they're um, sort of pictured equally. Do you do you consider them sort of of equal? Yes. Yeah, so uh, sort uh, of I don't have a better way to say it than like level in the department. Yeah, so I consider them equal, but their duties are quite different. Um, so Stella is largely financial reporting, for helping me with all the financial side. Um, Regina is overseeing the the day-to-day -day in the office, having a good grasp on everything that goes in our office, whether payroll, payables, um, AR, overseeing all the issues, taking on a lot of the projects, um, making sure that day-to-day -day the office is running smooth. Um, so those are the, the two big differences, but they... I view them as equal, but um, kind of a, a good separation of expectations or tasks. If you were absent or on vacation, would they sort of equally be in charge or is one person 
kind of the the go to there? Um, it would depend on what the issue would be. If it was something like tonight, council um, Stella would step in. If it's day to day decision making, um, that would likely be deferred to Regina. Okay. Um, I'm just sort of looking over the, the interfund transfers section of this, and I know that you just touched on several of these. So there is and... only one interfund transfer, and that is the Horace Man that's in the budget this year. Anytime a interfund transfer is voted during the year, it flows through my department line, which is why if you were to be looking at the actuals for 2021, 20, 22, uh, you would see other transfers figures in there. That's just the way it works. Uh, but there's only one item for transfers to other funds in the 24 budget. Okay. I'm looking over all the other big, uh, big ticket items that are here on page four that I'll just draw the committee's attention to because this budget is a pretty interesting one with a lot hitting on a lot of the um, kind of issues of the day, you would say, in our other conversations. Do we have other comments or questions from the committee on this budget? Madam Chief, is, are you talking about also retirement? Yes, uh, although I think what we should do if, um, if folks feel that the comptroller's budget is straightforward, obviously it's our practice to take a straw vote if we're ready. I don't really have a strong preference if we take the straw vote before we go to retirement or after. Uh, there, are, one I'll doesn't. Move, I'll move a straw vote just to keep things moving along. Okay, so um, we've got a motion for a straw vote. We do have a. Do we have two hands up? So let me go take those first. Councillor Malachy, then Humphrey, and then um, we'll take it from there. Go ahead, Councillor Malachy. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, the the workers' comp. Does that represent insurance premiums we pay to the state? Um, no, I don't think so. Maureen may be able to specify that, but I, not that I'm aware of. Ms. Lemieux. Thank you. So that was workers' comp, Councilor mm. Maliki? Yes. We, we are self-insured for workers comp. Oh. So we don't pay, we don't pay anything to the state. Um, this is a transfer that goes to our workers' comp trust fund. So we also, you'll also see a, um, a corresponding um, uh, appropriation, if you will, that is in um, the water sewer storm accounts. And I believe the school department carries their own workers okay. comp appropriation. Okay, I just wondered why it was the same every year. Um, but having recently experienced the workers comp system, it's terrible, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Humphrey. Thank you. This is just a clarifying process question here. Um, since retirement sort of falls under this, I guess, is what we're voting on just the department's budget or is it also the transfer into retirement? Even so if that's later. The retirement budget is within the comptroller's department. So I don't think it would be two separate votes, but that is up to all of you. Um, as part of the retirement line within the comptroller's budget is the appropriation to the pension fund, as well as retiree health benefits, retiree um, OPEB benefits and life benefits, as well as the Medicare Part B reimbursement. Hmm. But I figured there would be much more conversation with that. So I wanted to get everything else out of the way first. And then um, we could talk about retirement just from a, a conversational, not from a vote standpoint. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you for clarifying. Because I don't I don't think I had been thinking of it in that way. But obviously, that's been the topic of a lot of our conversations in the past few weeks, both of the retirement and the other um, benefits in the Medicare and so forth. And that's been kind of presented as a unilateral thing coming from the mayor, but I guess technically it's not completely. So the retirement obligation that's here is a vote from the Newton Retirement Board um, based off of old law and um, 
retirement law that the city hires an actuary and the actuary um, makes the actuarial valuation, which the Newton Retirement Board votes on. And within that vote is the appropriation for the annual budget. And that's a legally binding appropriation um, that needs to be funded by the city to Understood. the retirement board. Um, and in February, the Newton Retirement Board voted for, before all of the other conversation followed, they voted for the 9.6% increase in the appropriation, which is a higher figure than what you see here. And it's higher by that 1.16 million, which is over in the, the transfer line to Horace Mann. And so if the COLA vote did not pass, then this contributory pension figure would have to go up to what the original retirement board vote would have been back in February. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you for explaining all of that. You're welcome. Uh, and Councilor Humphrey, one of the pieces of sort of research and, and moving parts that um, came up over the course of the last few months was what the retirement board's um, authority is in that apparently if the city did not fund the appropriation at the level that they voted and we um, voted on the budget, that they then have the authority to compel the assessor to collect taxes up to the level that they voted to, pay, to fund that appropriation. Now that said, that's the one line here. Um, all these other lines, I mean, the health insurance line, um, the Medicare Part B, the OPEP contribution, those are not retirement board decisions. Those are administration decisions. Correct. And as um, you might recall with respect to the council's authority, our authority is to basically vote yes, vote no, essentially to no effect, or reduce, mm -hmm. but nothing in between. All right. Yeah. Th thank you for uh, adding that as well. That that was my sense of the situation. Um, and I think it is similar to like the discussion we had around the schools last year, which is that you have to provide a certain amount of allocation under state law. And so this is similar that the state backed retirement um, thing is is kicking in here. OK, thank you. Right. Now, that said, one thing I don't know the answer to and Mr. Curley, maybe you do. I see actually city solicitor Giuliani has joined us. Maybe she can answer this. If the council voted no on the call and the retirement board has made their intentions clear that they would then vote for a higher appropriation, but we've budgeted this number. I don't know if that changes the calculus at all. I mean, I don't know if the retirement board can just meet, you know, meet again and continue to change the number and make a different appropriation. I, I have to imagine that's probably splitting hairs, but. So my understanding of the situation, I know it's very fluid, is the retirement board back in February already voted for an appropriation. And so if the COLA vote that is in front of council is contingent, would change that FY24 appropriation contingent on the COLA vote being passed. And so if the COLA vote isn't passed, the vote from February would be the vote. And then the retirement board would figure out an actuarial valuation schedule either at the end of May at that meeting if it's appropriate at that time and Siegel has their figures or um, in the June meeting. And we can vote on, an, on a um, pension funding schedule through the end of the June meeting. Ms. Lemieux, did you wanna comment? And then Councilor Gentile, I see you've got your hand up too. Oh, thank you. Yes, Madam Chair, actually our comptroller and I um, have really started having these conversations to try to tease out um, exactly what would happen by us having the 1.16 um, number match exactly what was reduced from the pensions. Um, still somehow the retirement board or DOR, somebody would have to um, ensure that we ended up raising the 42, four ish 
um, that was the amount that the retirement board voted on. We would certainly, if all of that um, becomes moot and the retirement board is back at that 9.6% appropriation, we would certainly not be spending that million 160. Um, and I, we, what we haven't figured out is does that go back through the cleanest way is that it goes back through the council with a recommendation from the mayor to amend her budget to put that million 160 back into pensions. Um, we're certainly going to need legal, if if we get to that point, we're going to need um, a legal opinion to make sure that we do it all correctly. Um, but that's why we've presented the budget the way that we have so that we're very clean, just in case um, those votes don't go at least the way that they've been pre presented to you. Thank you, Councillor Gentile. So, this discussion really highlights how involved this subject matter is. And I just want to take everybody back to what Councillor Kalis advocated for at the Committee of the Whole on two separate occasions. And that was that the powers to be sit down and work out some kind of a compromise. Otherwise, this is going to get extremely involved. Um, I agree with what most, um, everything that Councilor Humphrey said about the similarities with last year's um, budget discussion in the vote, but with all due respect, the vote that was taken um, was, was more, um, you know, a statement about how folks felt about a, uh, I think, a lack of funding for the school department. As was just explained to us, the retirement board has the authority to mandate that the taxes be increased um, to fully fund the system as they voted. And I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. You know, but again, um, a peaceful resolution to all of this is really going to serve us all best. Because as I understand it, what's in front of us tonight, and I would strongly suggest that we don't vote on the retirement budget tonight, is to increase the retirement by 9.6%. That's the vote that was taken by the retirement board. Now, what's happened originally, now what happened subject to that was a vote that um, was taken to extend the funding schedule and to reduce that contribution to 6.6% and to increase the COLA um, for three years in a row by $1,000 up to 15. So is that not what's in front of us tonight? And I think maybe Steve, you're the best one to answer that. So the figures that are in front of you tonight, that pension line is based off of the 6.6% increase. And the difference in the 9.6 and the 6.6 .6 is down at that in that transfers to other funds line for the Horace Mann addition or renovation. Um, so what you see is based off of the 6.6% appropriation increase. For the general so, fund, obviously. And so that was that was based on the last vote that the retirement board took, which was to extend the funding schedule to 2032? Yes. So the vote would have been to um, extend the funding schedule to 2032 with a 6.6% .6 annual increase in appropriation contingent on the City Council approving three COLA base increases in FY24, FY24, 25, 26 by a thousand each year. Okay. And um, to be clear, the payment, the final payment would still be made August 2031 in calendar terms. So we're talking fiscal 32, but August 2031 in terms of the transfer of the of the payment to get us to full funding. Yes. Okay, and um, I did hear somebody mention that 
um, if in fact COLA doesn't go through, that the um, retirement board may well decide to change their vote with refer, you know, with reference to the funding schedule and the 9.6 versus 6.6. But I don't think that we can assume that. Um, there was a vote recently that sort of tested the retirement board's thinking and all of that um, when they were asked to um, support the letter that we all received from a couple of members of the retirement board. And, um, um, and that, you know, nobody else joined on. So, you know, it could be a three to two vote. No one really knows that for sure. And we all have to keep that in mind. So I guess I'm just making the point that um, we hopefully can get through a lot of this um, at the Committee of the Whole, because um, as, as somebody already said, a lot of moving parts. So I suggest that we um, hold this tonight. And uh, I mean, we should still continue to discuss it. I'm not trying to cut off debate, but that we hold it and see, you know, what happens with some of our um, of other meetings. And then I just have one question because the dates are always confusing to me. And I've been, you know, dealing with retirement for quite some time. I believe, and Tom Lopez is on, and he, he can speak to this too. But I believe that we are, when we talk about re the retirement board budget, we're all on the same fiscal year which, you know, um, July 1 to June the 30th. I think there's been some confusion in the past that the retirement board's on a calendar year. Now, I could have this wrong, but can somebody just please um, confirm that we're on the same um, fiscal year? So the retirement board, it does report on an annual calendar year. They, their fiscal year is January to December, but when they're referring to the appropriation to the pension fund, that is referred to in our fiscal year. Because that's where we come, you know, like if we appropriate whatever, $30 million, that money is literally transferred like on August the 1st, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. it, it just so happens where both of them, um, well, actually, so that would be our fiscal 24 using general fund voted 24 budget money. And that would go into the retirement boards. Um, Cause it would be their 23 because they're January 1st, 23 to December 31st, 23. All right. And then my last question and I'll let others. So can either Kelly or Tom speak to, I've heard them talk in the past that when they vote, they're almost like either six months ahead of us that their their vote is to request an appropriation for like six months or a year ahead of what we um, typically think of it being. And I just I think it's again, it's important to get these dates. I, I believe that they already voted in the past for fiscal 24 or however, you know, whatever the date, however the dates are made. And I just would like a little clarification on that. Um, why don't I see if they're available to answer? And I just want to make sure they understand your question. Uh, Ms. Byrne and Mr. Lopez, are you available and listening to answer that question right now? Maybe yes, you need to. Oh, okay. Um, did you under did you hear and understand the question, or do you need counselor? I think Gentile it goes to, to a, 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 a council Gentile can correct me, but I think it goes to the same question that you had asked, as far as and um, when we have to take action. We start our preliminary work with our actuary in January to come in and give us some preliminary numbers, and then we um, start our process and try to have the uh, appropriations and everything figured out by budget time. But uh, legally, from what I understand, and, and it actually goes to the bu budget of the city, 
June 30th. Now we don't want to wait till June 30th to make a decision because I don't know how you're going to vote your budget out and everything. But if I think that's what I'm speaking to, and if I'm wrong, Council Gentile, you can correct me and I'll, I'll re-answer it. Does that answer your question, Councilor Gentile? So Tom, are we, but, but how was uh, someone, um, Steve just said that, you know, but basically you guys operate on a calendar year. Mr. Lopez, uh, or Ms. Burns. Say that again, Council Gentile. So you up, but, but I think I heard Steve say that you, while we operate on a fiscal year, July 1 to June 30th, you actually operate on a calendar year. Do I have that right? Right. So our budget was, our FY24 budget was based off 1122 data. So that's how we sort of build our budget from there. And that's what it's based off of. Does that answer the question? Ms. Lemieux has her hand up. Do you want to, Ms. Lemieux, do you want to try to clarify and add um, to that? Thank you. If, if I may, I think where the confusion is, is the actuarial valuation for the pension fund is from the calendar year. So that's always as of January 1st. Um, the actuarial valuation of the OPEB fund is through June 30th. Um, so when you see the appropriation for pensions um, in this book, because we transfer, because we have the cash flow that we do as a city, we can we do the entire transfer um, in in one um, motion, if you will, and so it completely moves. I think it might be even more confusing if we were a community that had to make that transfer over a twelve month period. But when you see um, the appropriation that's here, uh, that's the money that moves in August of 23. And just to just to further complicate it a bit, I think is many, many times if the retirement board has set their funding schedule and we're not looking to change um, the, you know, the date of when it would be fully funded or we're not looking to change um, the discount rate. There have certainly been years where they've set their funding schedule and there's been no change, you know, to next year. So sometimes they've set it for uh, two years, even three years in a row with it not changing. Um, that's all based on pretty much what has happened to the fund. Right. But I think the valuation in particular is what's really done on the calendar year and is probably the most, um, probably the largest difference. So let me ask this last question. What's in front of us tonight, whether it's it's 6.6, .6, whatever, are we being asked to fund the retirement needs for July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, um, 2024, or are we being asked to fund the retirement board's needs from January 1st of 2024 to December 31st of 2024? That's, I guess, what I'm asking. And, and so it is the former. Uh, so you are being asked to fund uh, July 1st through June 30th. All right. Thank you. That's what I was trying to get at. And, and I just still, make sure I, I still understand. think there's so many, so many I'm things sorry, to ahead. discuss that we need to hold the retirement, but I appreciate the answer. Um, and and I, I'm in agreement of holding. I mean, a straw vote. I don't even know that we need a motion for a straw vote. I mean, our practice has always been, we have a straw vote if we're ready. I mean, you made a motion for a straw vote. Maybe instead you want to make a motion to hold this particular budget. But um, I guess the other thing that I just want to make sure I understand is the line that says the pension contribution of $41.2 million. That's a, that is essentially a transfer to the retirement system on August 1st of 2023 in full of that amount, right? Correct. And that pays for both the um, contribution to catching up on our liability 
as well as what it costs to run the retirement system. Is that also correct? Yes. It's going towards our liability, towards the pension payrolls for all of the retirees, as well as running the retirement system with the admin expenses, the um, their payroll for the three staff, um, that whole ordeal. And obviously in um, chunks over the course of the year, there's additional money flowing in and out of their budget through employee contributions and retirement benefits paid. Yes, as well as um, other communities are paying portions to us. Um, they're called 3HC payments. If someone worked in multiple communities and depending on where they retire and we do the opposite and pay other communities. So there's, there's inflows and outflows of that as well um, and other revenues and expenses that go on. Are there also inflows and outflows for the water and sewer pieces? Uh, um, parts of our pension funding that come from other so they their budget the water sewer storm all have their portion of the of the full appropriation amount which is the um based off of the 9.6 or i guess because the the 6.6 is in front of you the 6.6 full appropriation would be 43.54 million as you can see in the general fund budget, that's 41.2 million. So the other 2.3 million comes from water, sewer, storm, CPA, CDBG, a few revolving funds, um, Newton Housing Authority, and I, I, I'm probably missing one or two, but I think I, I basically got them all. And does that flow in and out through the retirement office as well, or those flow in and out of their own accounts? That is all on one single August 1st appropriation into the pension fund. And then all of those inflows and outflows happen within the retirement boards, banking, pension funds. Um, so, so when we vote on the water and sewer and stormwater portions of the budget, that includes their August 1st lump yes. sum payment as well. Yeah. Yes. Same with CD, um, I'm sorry. CDBG, CPA. CPA. CDBG, okay. They both contribute. Ms. Lemieux, did you want to clarify something else? Your hand is still up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I only have it up for when we move off of this particular line item. I just wanted to make another comment on this section. So okay. um, after me... after everyone is done with the questions on pensions. All right. Councillor Kalis, you're next. My only comment is I thought that moving hold is the right thing here. Um, or you know, I, I just don't think we should be voting on it before we meet as, as a full council. Um, I will just reiterate that the depth of the complexity here is why I really didn't want to be in this position as a council of having to make these decisions this quickly under the pressure of our budget deadline. And unfortunately, that is the hand we have been dealt. Um, and the different actions that I've taken before you all to try to wrestle with this have just all been in the vein of trying to figure out how we get through this and get to the best possible um, outcome in the time we have, and it's been difficult. Uh, Ms. Lemieux, what comment did you wanna make about the section? Thank you. So the only uh, comment that I wanted to make is that not only when you look at this budget, uh, not only did we reflect, um, you know, the potential vote for the COLA with only 6.6 .6 going to retirement, the, I want to make sure that everyone is clear on the 3,187 that's listed as the OPEB contribution there. That is the motion that was made uh, or reflective of the motion that was made at the school committee at the very end of their deliberations. So that entire 3.187 is uh, what was in the school department's budget for OPEP. All of the um, municipal 
contributions to OPEB are scattered throughout all of the municipal departments. So that 3.187 uh, is not the full OPEB appropriation. And in fact, the full appropriation is something um, over $4 million, I would say, but the municipal side is scattered throughout. So I just want to make sure everybody knows what you are looking at on that line. And then on the Medicare Part B line, the city side of the Medicare Part B would have been a budget of uh, 875 had we not uh, made the changes that we are making to Blue Cross and to the Medicare Part B program. And so again, we have already in this budget before you, we have already reflected those changes. And then just the last one, which I think has certainly been said, just to make sure everyone is clear, the million 160 um, in the interfund transfers is the money that would um, that is the reduction in pensions that would go toward the design of um, the Horace Mann um, project. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands everything that's in front of you in this budget book reflects everything that we have been talking about. So which you know if there are pieces that don't come to fruition. Um, uh, then we'll have to figure out what we do uh, with what the budget actually looks like. Councillor Gentile. So um, I have a lot of questions because I don't understand a lot about this $3.1 million transfer. We can get into that when we do the budget. So I'm not even going to go there. Secondly, it really bothers me that we're tying retirement board action to the Horace Mann School. I'm sorry, we've never we've never done that in the past. I mean, they're separate items. Um, Horace Mann isn't more important or less important than a lot of other schools that we're trying to rebuild in this city. So why we're we, why we're tying the two together? I, I I just think that that is wrong. But however, I'll pass by that. And then as far as the retirement board stuff, um, we do have some options. Um, we could decide um, to stay the course for one more year, see what happens with um you know our investment returns and revisit the item you know next year um I'm, you know that's a healthy discussion um and um the worst thing that would happen is that we put in a sizable contribution this year as we have been uh instead of kicking the problem down the road that's not a bad thing for the retirement system. And um, I think that uh, Kathy Riley, I've heard it described that way that, you know, putting a little extra money in is never a bad thing for the retirement system. So I think we have some options. Um, I'm not sure that they're going to be, would be warmly received because I know that some people are trying to find um, extra money from the school system and I get it. Um, but we, you know, there are other ways, you know, of looking at this. And I think that there's a compromise out there as Councilor Kalis keeps, you know, pushing us to try and get to where, you know, there doesn't have to be three years of, um, COLA increases and, you know, it doesn't have to be nine, six, it doesn't have to be six, six, the contribution, um, and I think we just have to keep working towards that. Um, anyway, but I, I I I think that there's a lot of options out there, and some that probably haven't even been figured out yet, um, that we just need to continue to work on. And so, Gentile, I can I can promise you, I am trying. Others are trying. I I cannot indicate to you that I think that our efforts at achieving a compromise are headed anywhere. 
um, but our committee of the whole discussion on Wednesday, we're going to do our best to lay out in the simplest terms possible what our main options are and see if we as a council can get to an agreement of what we think the right path is to pursue. I agree with you on the Horace Mann piece here that's been really bothering me. Um, we're going to have to keep talking it out in the committee of the whole. I think tonight the the best we're going to be able to do is hold it. I I can at least tell you, and, and Miss Lemieux certainly can, about the OPEB contribution line here, if you want to know now. Uh, it, otherwise, I suppose we can also discuss it in the school budget, although I don't even know if it's in the school budget anymore. I mean, if it's there, I think you might be talking about something that's not even in the book any longer. It, it, if I can just jump in, it is not in the school budget any longer. This is where it uh, resides now. So do you want to, Councilor Gentile, go ahead, but I think Ms. Lemieux should probably take two seconds and explain. I understand, by the way, this discussion's going on a while. I hope everybody can just bear with me. I, we're going to be having long meetings from now through the end of the budget process, and I just think it's really important for everybody to understand. If you feel like we're getting too far down a rabbit hole, please speak up. I'm certainly... Uh, I will warmly receive your feedback. I, I just want to make sure everybody understands everything. Councilor Gentile, go ahead. I'm all set. I've, I've had plenty to say, and, and um, I just think other people should weigh in. Okay, Councilor Kalis and Maliki. I, I just want to, I want to hear out what Ms. Lemieux has to say. I want to understand the implications of that three, that three million from the school committee budget to uh, to this budget. What does that mean? I mean, it's the contribution to OPEB, but um, does that mean the city now takes takes on the burden of OPEB for the schools for for forever now? Yeah, uh, Miss Lemieux, when you answer, if you could explain a little bit of the background of the motion that was on the table at the school committee that led to this decision, I think that would provide a lot of um, important background to folks. Okay, um, the so the Newton Public Schools budget had this three million one hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars as part of the budget. It's made up of uh, this year. It will be three point seven five percent of everyone who is taking health insurance who started taking health insurance since July first of twenty twelve. That amount grows by more than three and a half percent each year, because as you still have more and more people who this appropriation is being applied against, and it's strictly a city, it's a, um, a paper appropriation, if you will, the employees don't pay into this. Um, it's, it's money that we more or less charge ourselves, but it's a strategy of how, what we put together um, to, to help this appropriation increase. Members of the school committee were struggling with um, the fact that within their budget, there was three, almost $3.2 million that was going to OPEB when some people thought that um, they would be better served if they reduced that number and took some of those funds and reappropriated that money um, to teachers or any other educational issues. So the, the motion on the floor initially at the school committee was to reduce their OPEB appropriation by, um, I think it was a million three. The mayor, um, I, I believe, amended the motion uh, to say, if you would like to the school committee, we will be more than happy to take the full 3.2 million out of your budget, put it into the retirement section of the city budget, and we will manage it from there. Um, I don't think it means it will stay here forever over the course of time, but I think it's here for a while. Um, and so we will grow this appropriation as we do the pensions. Um, the you know we, we all know how important it is and how far behind we are with our OPEB contributions. And so, um, the mayor certainly did not want to see, um, nor, nor is it really uh, financially prudent for us to reduce the amount of money that's going into OPEB. And so we took that money out of their budget. So the mechanics 
of what happened. They started with a $262 million budget for fiscal 23. We added three and a half percent to their budget initially. This was prior to the override vote. That brought them to 271.242, I believe. Okay, so 271.2. The $10 million free cash item that is in front of you uh, was our strategy to pay down uh, because the Horace Mann portion, uh, the operating override didn't pass. What we did was say, well, we'll take $10 million, put it toward the Lincoln Elliott um, project so that we can bond or have an annual bond payment of $600,000 less each year because we'll bond less money. That $600,000 savings in debt service payments, we then added to the school department budget. This brought them up to 271.8. That's what their budget was initially when they printed their book. And then uh, what we did was with this motion is take that 271.8, reduce it back to 268.6, I think it is, and took the 3.1 out of there. Their budget will continue, whether this money was in or out, really will not make any difference to their educational um, funding available to them. Their 3.5% um, percent, it actually improves it for them. Their appropriation, if all goes according to uh, plan, let's say next year, their appropriation would increase by 3.5%. They will not have to worry next year if their OPEB would have increased by 5% because they have more people now who are insured since 2012. If their OPEB was going to grow by 5% and their total increase is only growing by 3.5%, they have to take a little bit of money out of that you know, additional appropriation that they're getting for education and put it toward their OPEB appropriation. That's what the impetus was um, for this whole vote and movement of these funds. So I as I say, one. now- we, I hold, hold on I'm, one sec. Ms. Lemieux, you, you finish. I want to say something and then Councillor Kales. Okay. So now this money will be in the retirement fund where we will manage its growth as we do uh, whatever the pension contribution growth is. Um, they'll follow more or less a different schedule. So these funds won't be based on just simply a 3.5% uh, increase. Just before we continue, I, we started getting there into other docket items that are before us in other meetings. I want to be really careful that we're not starting to deliberate things that are not before us tonight in a meeting that wasn't noticed for those things. So if we could try to rein it into the line item that we're talking about, which is in this budget before us of the OPEB contribution without getting down the path of some of those other items, I'd like to try to steer us in that direction. Councilor Kalis. Okay, um, just sticking on this, this is really quick. Um, do, so the school committee all voted for this? Yes, so not unanimously. One, no, yeah, I think there was one that the voted person who against made the initial and might have been motion did one not extension. support this. Okay, so essentially they're voting to give us the responsibility because they can't trust themselves to, Not a, to, to maintain the OPEP. I, I think at this point, we should probably let the school committee speak for themselves okay. on Wednesday night. <laughs> I think there was a difference in opinion um, and that's all publicly recorded and out there for anybody who wants to go back and see it. Uh, the initial intent of the person who made the motion and where things ended up were two different things. Yeah. But See, if we if get I, if I had said that, I would be in so much trouble, Councilor Kalis, but you can get away with it because you're a nice guy. <laughs> had said what? <laughs> what did he say that I missed? That the, that the school committee can't trust themselves. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> all right. Did I just repeat that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's stop there. Um, do you, Does everybody, do we get the $3 million and why it's here? I just wanted to, I wanted to understand it. That, that really helps. All right. All set for now. 
Yes. All right. Councillor Malachy. Uh, thank you. Um, this is probably a really stupid question, but um, the the 1.16 million uh, Horace Mann transfer, is that expect, expected or committed to be an annual amount? Is that reflecting like the bond payments for 20 years or whatever? Is, is that going to be... Uh if, if I may, Madam Chair, that's actually not, not a dumb question at all. It's a great question. Uh, that is uh, just about the amount that we would need to uh, do the uh, final design work and to get to a point where um, we would have a site plan approval for it. The remaining expenditures for that facility will be bonded and would ultimately land in debt service. Okay, so... For purposes of the budget, this is a one-time thing in this year's budget and a amount that maybe it'll be similar magnitude, maybe it won't, would be elsewhere in the budget. An, an amount that we would expect would be approximately 1.3 million. Um, it, you know, and it might take us two years to get there. We never bond everything in the same year when we're building a school. But uh, by the time we're finished, we would anticipate that the cost for Horace Mann would be about 1.3 million a year. That would be within our debt service numbers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you in one second, Councillor Oliver. So, Ms. Lemieux, we talk a lot about one time funds for one time expenditures, this Horace Mann piece of money appears to be a one-time expenditure, but a reduction in our pension appropriation is something that speaks to a long-term change. How do you square that? So uh, thank you. The, the, this is a one-time use of that money for next year. Um, however, the savings, if you will, in the pension um, appropriation, the difference between a 9.6% increase each year and a 3.6% increase in each year is um, in year one, it's a million 160. In year two, it's about 2.4 million. And year three, and it actually compounds, so it grows a little bit more than just adding another 1.16 million to it. But this over time, by seven years from now, um, I, I want to say it's probably a eight or nine million dollar difference in, or maybe even 10, uh, difference in the appropriation that we would see, say, in a fiscal 2030 budget with a 6.6% .6 appropriation versus a 9.6. So that number will compound fairly rapidly. What we anticipate is that the bulk of that money will go toward um, lowering the gap. As you all know, whenever we put a budget together, um, we always have had a, a um, gap that has grown over the several years. So when we put our 10 year budget together, we have a pretty, pretty significant gap as it's growing, always with the intent that we would manage to it. Uh, changing the appropriation from 9.6 to 6.6 .6 will dramatically impact what that gap would be and will enable the city to really sustainably look at the school department and say, we'll be able to provide a 3.5% increase each year instead of you know, perhaps a few years from now, needing to, needing to shrink those uh, the operating appropriations to continue to fund the pensions. So it's it's all interconnected. All right. This is just to put it out there. One of the objections that I have to tying the pension fund to this particular use of funds. It's we've got all this one time money out there, and yet this is this is the thing that's tied. And uh, I mean, more to come. I think. Uh, as we march down this process, but it's a tough one. Uh, Councillor Oliver, go ahead, please. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Couldn't agree with that last point more. Um, just, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear on the, you know, uh, this, uh, the 3.1. Uh, my, uh, I think, I think it's it, as simple as asking it this way. This contribution, right, ends up funding 
some ends up refunding again something that the school committee voted to, or, or at one point there was a motion to take out of their budget, correct? This the motion was money. to reduce it this right. year. Correct. To not pay as much into the OPEB trust this year as they are otherwise budgeted to pay. I think with the intent of we have other priorities other than funding the OPEB trust in this way. That was the original motion. That's not where it ended. And that was not the vote of the school committee ultimately. But there is, this is that line item, correct? This is what ultimately happened yeah. to that line item. Awesome. I do appreciate the clarification. Thank you. OK, Councilor Gentile, you had made a motion <laughs> for a straw vote on the comptroller's budget. Uh, is it fair to say you've got a motion to hold the comptroller's budget at this point? Did we lose him? Councillor Kalis. Sorry, was somebody looking? Y yes. Um, so I think we're at the point where we'd had a motion from you initially for a straw yeah. vote on the comptroller's budget. Is it fair to say we could call that a motion to hold at this point yes. on the comptroller's Please. budget? Please, okay, sorry great. to hold you up. No, 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 that's okay. I just wanted to respect your motion. Um, any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of holding the comptroller's budget right now, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, now we've got the retirement system. Um, we have on here uh, Ms. O'Brien, Ms. Byrne, Mr. Lopez. I want to turn the floor to you. We usually hear from you um, at this time. I know we're in an unusual set of circumstances, but if you could please uh, introduce what, uh, what you would like to say, both about your budget and operations, as, as well as the system overall, this, this is that time. Hi, it's Kelly Byrne here. How are you tonight? We're well. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I didn't expect to speak at all. Tom just messaged me. He had to leave. Um, and okay. I know Barbara is on here and I wasn't sure if Barbara was prepared to speak as we hadn't spoken before the meeting. So just really quickly I'm here. Okay, a couple of quick comments. Um, as far as the timing goes that was discussed. Um, as you may all know, we're regulated by mass state laws, not city ordinances and all that. And mass state law chapter 32 actually dictates how our accounting cycle proceeds. We do operate on a calendar year basis. We do report, report all our financials to the state on a calendar year basis. So the FY24 appropriation that's before you now is based on the January 1st, 2022 actuarial valuation report. And that report would be based on calendar year 2021 financials and our active member and retiree membership data that we send them. Um, you know, Tom, Tom alluded to the fact that we have a, a process that we do every year in getting to our appropriation. In January, um, we basically, you know, we have an open meeting to, to first begin the discussions on that January 1st actuarial evaluation. Um, I know several councils, you know, will attend that. It's kind of like a think tank, if you want. We throw some ideas out there to the actuary. Um, about some draft funding schedules and assumptions that we'd like to see her have. The city contributes to that. Councils have contributed to that as well as the retirement board. And that basically um, is where we're at right now with the January 1st, 23 actuary evaluation. Um, Kathy Riley from Siegel, who is our actuary, will have all those final numbers to present to us at our May meeting. We don't have those final actuarial valuation numbers before us right now. Now, in February, we voted our FY24 budget because we, based on the 1122 actuarial valuation that dictates the appropriation. This was well before any of these other discussions 
came forward. It was before the override bill to pass. Um, and then the board was um, approached by both the mayor's office and I'm gonna call them the glam group because that's kind of stuck in my head with two different presentations at our March meeting of how they would like to see the board move forward in adopting an, um, a, var a variation of a funding schedule and possibly include some cost of living increases. So at the April special meeting, the retirement board voted to move the funding schedule out to 2032 at a 6.6% .6 growth rate contingent on the retirement board's request to the council to pass that three-year incremental COLA. Okay, and Steve, I know you already spoke to this. I don't want to repeat and Barbara, you add anything you think I'm missing, um, but that vote is contingent on the council's approval of that. If the council does not approve that, we as a board at our May meeting will make a decision on how we're moving forward and on what funding schedule. So nothing's been decided at our end is basically what I'm saying. Um, thank you, Ms. Byrne. Ms. O'Brien, did you wanna speak? I think um, Kelly summed it up very well, unless anyone has any questions. Uh, like she said, Kathy Riley scheduled to come to our May meeting, May 23rd, I believe. Um, she'll be there. All are welcome to attend. <laughs> uh, and I'll no, remind the I, finance I, committee, we have, a, we have a finance committee meeting that night as well, which I had forgotten about as an okay. additional meeting on our schedule. So just to sort of remind you all that um, we do have sort of some extra opportunities for discussing some of these different items as we put our agendas together. I'm sorry, Ms. Byrne, were you saying something else or Ms. Yeah, O'Brien, I, I wasn't obviously sure. Obviously it's gonna be helpful to everybody if the committee as a whole can make a decision this Wednesday, really will give us direction at our meeting where we're going. Um, or, you know, if, 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 if you pass it and, you know, we're gonna stay with the 2032 funding date at the 6.6% .6 increasing, everybody will know immediately where we're landing. Um, and that's not to put any pressure on anybody. We didn't ask to be put into this position. Um, you know, it's just these two presentations that are before us now that we've been asked to act on. Um, and so hopefully, um, as Council Gentile alluded to, there's a compromise in there that we all can live with at the end of the day. Okay, I don't have any hands up. Do we have comments or questions from the committee? Are we able to hold this one as well or? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I've never really thought we have a, a vote with respect to this particular part of the discussion. It's really, it's always something that we include in, but it's, it's like not something we report out to the committee as a right. whole and vote on. And effectively, um, it sounds like we don't have a vote on it. Cause right. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the motion to hold because, you know, just to cover ourselves just in case, but ultimately, I don't really think there's any action to take. Councilor Gentile? So, I, I just want to, um, in, in response to what Kelly said, um, I think everything that she laid out is correct. I guess I'd just like to go on, um, I'd go, like to go on the record right now that if we were to go ahead and vote the um, COLA increase, um, I, I, I also think that we're going to lose the Medicare Part B reimbursement, which is a pretty substantial amount of money for individuals and families. And uh, so I just think that everybody needs to know that that at least I think that that's what the outcome will be, unless we can find a compromise, which is what Kelly also mentioned. And David Kalis has been mentioning, and I keep mentioning, and I'll leave it at that. And if I Councilor could just... Oh. Go ahead, Ms. Byrne. I'll I'm sorry, I, I'm on my iPad oh, and I can't find the little hand to hit to raise, so I apologize for interrupting. That's okay. 
Um, but if I just want to clarify something, Lenny, that you had said earlier, um, you know, Tom and I, as the two elected members of the board, did send a letter out as a result of that of the mayor phasing out the Medicare B reimbursement, um, and we were very upset about that. We, the, it's not that the retirement board didn't sign on to that. We, Tom and I had asked, we wanted to distribute that letter to the retirees with their April 30 pension payments. And some of the retirement board members felt uncomfortable doing that only because Medicare is not under the authority of the retirement board, which we thought was very fair. But um, that was gonna be an e immediate and very easy means of communication to getting some, you know, this word out to the retirees. Um, so, so it was just that the board members didn't want to sign on to that letter um, because Medicare was not under their purview. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that statement. What, just 30, 30 seconds. Uh, Councilor Kalis, is that okay with you? Yeah. Since yeah. I told you to be next. Councilor Gentile, go ahead. But Kelly, if we're going to change, if we're going to prevent retirees, um, from losing that poppy reimbursement, then the retirement board may well have to rethink their vote that they took. Is that a fair? I think that's fair. That's what that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, it wasn't so much a vote. We, it really came down to like the pension payments would be meal were being mailed out like a day or two after that board meeting date. It was also a timing thing to, to for the staff to be able to get that out on a timely basis. Um, you but know, I, th I think in the past, Lenny, you know, the retirement board is very careful to be very neutral in these situations, political or otherwise, you know, they, their, their re fiduciary responsibility is to the membership and the solvency of the retirement system is what weighs behind the decisions they make. While we're very unhappy about the Medicare be, being phased out, we wrote to the unions, we wrote to the mayor, we wrote to the counselors. Um, I can't speak for the other board members why they did not want to put that in with the pension payments. Maybe it was just too quick of an action for them to process, I'm not sure. But if push came to shove, it could well end up that the retirement board wouldn't reverse their de decision. Not that you would necessarily agree with it, I don't think you would, um, or Tom for that matter, but we can all read the tea leaves and, um, um, that's why I think that um, we ought to come to some kind of a compromise. I agree. Thanks. C Councilor Kalis. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, um, uh, Madam Chair, are, are you, so are you working with GLAM to try to broker something between the mayor and the retirement board at this point or no? Um, trying to think of. I'm just trying to make sure it's fine to answer that question. I you think, don't have to, think that's that? fine. No, I mean, look, the answer is yes. I mean, we've okay. been talking several times a day, every day for a long time. I mean, it's it has been a very, very, very intense and all-consuming process. Um, we've had several conversations and meetings between our last committee of the whole and the next committee of the whole, and I think we'll open the next committee of the whole talking about it. There's been no substantial change or any movement. And if um, if the sticking point that I that I think I'm hearing coming from um, yourself and Councilor Gentiles, the Medicare Part B piece, I, I don't know where the meeting may take us, but I can tell you from my standpoint, I don't see any movement to be had there barring some other um, input or, or idea uh, more creative coming on the table. I, I just, um, it's not in our purview. It's not in the retirement board's purview. It's the administration's decision and they've made their announcement and their decision and I won't speak for them. I'll let them speak for themselves, but um, I don't see it moving beyond that. Okay. I that just particular to... piece where, where compromise involves that piece. Right. I mean, where the quote unquote glam group started had nothing to do with Medicare. I know, therapy. I know. Those weren't the compromises we were even talking about. Yeah. Um, that obviously ended up dominating the committee of the whole discussion last week. I totally understand why. Um, it's kind of another wrinkle in an otherwise extremely complicated process otherwise. 
Yeah, it's a significant wrinkle. And um, I, I, I think that it uh, not only affects, I mean, basically what you're talking about, to me, I, I always boil it down to two things. One is, you, you know, the override failed. So the Horace Mann community wasn't going to get the school. And so what the administration did is just put the the onus or the burden or whatever it is on the retirees, number one. And number two, instead of Horace Mann, number two, I think what we've talked about today about retaining talent, attracting talent, you can't have promises that are made to people that work in the city and to retirees and then unilaterally then remove one of the benefits. What does that tell, what does that say to, to employees that are looking to the city to work here? Um, to me, that is a, a huge issue and, and one that I, I don't know was thought through. That's all I have to say. Okay, um, any other questions for the retirement folks? Ms. Lemieux, just, I just want to give you the opportunity. I don't know if you want to say anything, but you're welcome to if you want to. Thank you. The only comment I will make, because hopefully um, we will have a robust discussion on Wednesday night, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands that these um, were really two completely different decisions that actually the timing was terrible. It all landed almost on the same day. That if, had we not bid out our insurance, our health insurance this year, um, what probably would have happened is we would have gone to the retirement board, talked about the COLA and extending um, the pension funding for a year. That was its own decision and own um, thought process, if you will. When we bid out our health insurance, and we can certainly get into this over the course of the next month, but the fact of the matter is that our retirees will be saving $700 a year. So yes, I completely, I completely understand um, the concerns and the feeling that, um, you know, if you're paying $55 a month less for something. I will tell you for myself, it doesn't feel the same as if you gave me a six or a seven or an $800 check in one fell swoop, which is what people get. So people will save, retirees will save about $700 a year. And ultimately by 2025, not have the Medicare Part B reimbursement. But it's not, it's not that it's the full 925 that's actually be being taken. It's really in true context, it's 225. So I just want to make sure, before, you know, that, to, it, <clears throat> excuse me, that tonight we don't leave that piece of the conversation unsaid. I'm sure there'll be plenty more to say on Wednesday. Um, but the retirees are absolutely going to be saving money throughout the course of the year. I just, Councilor Kalis, then Gentile. I just have to, but and you correct me if I'm wrong. That I, I I hear your point there, Ms. Lemieux, but that's for one year, maybe two years. Healthcare, you know, it, there's always inflation. That number is going to be reduced and reduced over the years, and so they're not going to have that those savings. So, so if I may, Madam Chair, actually, it's, it's the opposite. Thank you. It's the opposite. That number is going to grow over the years because that 700 is the delta. And so what they would have been spending over the course of the next several years would have increased, say, by 5% a year. And then this 700 Certainly what they're paying this year will increase, but the savings mm -hmm. ends up increasing. So it's really a higher number than 700 a year, not a lower number. And we can even, I'll even put something together to help people at least understand. I want to make sure that everyone gets you that know, the mechanics help. and the math. Um, as opposed to, I don't want to argue the policy with you, but I want to make sure that everybody um 
really has a very clear insight into the math of what okay. we looked at. That would help. Thank you. Could you also identify the assumptions? For example, I understood the math to be based on an assumption that someone goes to the doctor seven times a year. I know I go to the yes. doctor more than seven times a year. I'm a relatively, you know, healthy, maybe not so young anymore person, but um, you know, how that, how those assumptions, I think that's important to understand too, that in some, in many cases, the savings right now is realistically more than $700 a year. I'm not saying that to make an argument one way or the other. I'm just pointing out my, my understanding or more asking you to confirm my understanding of the math. And I will confirm that, that what we tried to do was be very conservative. Um, and so my guess would be most of our retirees or most of the people who are uh, impacted by this probably do go to the doctor more than seven times a year. Um, we didn't want to overstate what that number was because then, you know, it, it would have looked as though we were just trying to say that people um you know, we're saving more on their insurance. And so we didn't want to overinflate that. Uh, Councilor Gentile, you're up. Um, quickly, um, I believe everything that Maureen said about the timing and how this came down and um, all the negotiations in terms of the health insurance and um, I'm hopeful that um, has been represented that, you know, we're going to have a, a huge savings and everybody's going to end up with as good, if not better services. I, I believe all of that. Um, but I'm not going to get into the numbers. That's for another night as far as what this means to retirees. But I've, I've said this since the first time the increase in the COLA came in. Uh, for discussion. To me, retiree benef benefits are twofold. Number one is the check you get for the number of years you worked in your three highest years. That's easy to understand. And the second benefit, which is equally important as you get older, is your health care um, plan. And I believe that we made a pledge to our retirees that we, when you retired, you would get the same health care benefits that you got when you were retiring, when you retired, 80, you know, 80, 20, whatever, no better and no worse. And this Medicare Part B reimbursement, which is $925 a month and $1,800 for some families, um, should not be taken away in my opinion. So again, that's a discussion for another day. I do think that there's, you know, compromise that could be reached that's fair to everybody. And uh, hopefully we can get that done, that's all. Okay, I think that's all the hands. And just in case, why don't we have a motion to hold our discussions on the retirement piece? Is there such a motion? I'll move to hold. Okay, motion to hold by Councillor Humphrey. Any discussion before we vote? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, Ms. Byrne and Ms. O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us. Um, apologies to Mr. Lopez that we didn't get to this earlier and the opportunity to have him speak as well, but undoubtedly our conversation will continue with the committee the whole on Wednesday and um, hope you're able to uh, tune in then. I, I, I honestly don't know right now who's signed up to join, but uh, I trust we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. you okay, um, let's go forward to, um, the Treasurer's Department. And Mr. Mendez, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for joining us. If we no could problem. please have you introduce your budget. Sure. So my budget um, starts, um, I'll just kind of go through the, the order that they appear in the budget book. Uh, starts with the state assessments. Uh, those state assessments pretty much come to us through the, uh, the cherry sheet that comes from the state. Um, they're deducted from state aid that comes in. This is sort of 
how it gets accounted for, mostly represented by the MBTA um, assessment, which is uh, Newton's share of, of, um, of the MBTA's um, assessments throughout the district. So, and as well as several other items that are listed there. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions about that, um, but if not, I, I can move on to the core part of uh, the Treasury Department's uh, budget. So um, we do have a hand up, Councilor oh, Gentile. Sorry. Do you have a question about that? Might be a residual hand from before. Why don't it's you continue? Not, it's been up for a while. Okay, sorry, okay. I wasn't sure. Go ahead, Mr. Mendez. Okay, not a problem. So, so moving on to um, the next section of the budget, which is the personnel services uh, uh, lines for the Treasury Department. Uh, you may have noticed in the budget materials that we are. Um, looking at deferring one uh, FTE in our department. And um, I'll just talk briefly about that. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. But um, but we did have one position where a person left. The person left the position for another job opportunity in October of 2021. So we're now at a point where we've been a year and a half almost without that position. Um, and, and that position's responsibilities were a couple of things. Number one, they they transported the money to the bank every day, the daily deposit to the bank. And um, and I would just point out that now instead of depositing, instead of transporting our deposits to the bank, we're, we, we have scanners in the office. So we actually scan them now and deposit electronically. So there isn't a need to deposit at the bank unless we accumulate any um, amount of cash, which we really don't accumulate a lot of cash anymore. Um, the, um, the the parking meter cash goes straight to the bank from from DPW workers and uh, and any cash we do accumulate if we we have certain levels if we reach those levels then we go to the bank with that money uh, but we reach that level probably once a week at this point so so we don't need somebody to transport money to the bank anymore and then the other um, major responsibility for that person was to book all of the departmental receivables. So a lot of the other departments receive money for various services. And that money is then turned over, has been traditionally turned over to the Treasury Department. Um, but with the advent of new technology, like the new OpenGov system, which is doing the online permitting and uh, many of the other services being put online with City Hall systems, those revenues are now coming into our bank accounts electronically as opposed to having checks and cash being having to be turned over to the Treasury Department. So so the need for that level of work has reduced as well. So so this reduction of an FTE is really just more along the really more attributable to increases in our use of technology and um, and not um, really for any other reason. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, if there are any if there are any questions along the line, feel free to just interrupt me. But um, but I would go into at that at this point just some of the other um, focuses of the department. So our our primary focus in the Treasury Department is to obviously take in all of the city's um, receipts and deposit those into the bank, and then we manage that money while it's in the bank. So um, so one of the uh, focuses you know as of late is just you know making sure that money is held um, that it's collateralized, that it's insured, that our deposits are, are managed appropriately. Uh, so we, we do take care to make sure that all of the banks we deposit our money into are um, rated by an independent rating agency. We use Verabank. Um, they are rated at green or triple star. I can go into that in a little more detail if you want, but, but we make sure that they're the, of the highest rating uh, as far as the safety and security of the banks that we do deposit into. And then within that, we also take care to make sure that our deposits are insured at 100% or collateralized, um, uh, fully collateralized, so that we minimize or eliminate the risk of uh, losing any of our deposits. So, so that, that's sort of our focus when we are looking at managing the bank accounts. And then in addition to that, um, we're also looking for the highest rate that we can get. Um, as you may have noticed, interest rates have just gone up over the last year, last not even a whole year, um, dramatically. And, and we can see that in our investment income receipts that we've been taking in, 
Um, you know, we, we took it, we're, we're, we've already taken in about $5 million this year in investment income, and that was budgeted to be about $600,000. So, so that's just purely as a result of uh, increased, um, of the increasing interest rates. So um, if there are any questions along the way, I'm happy to, um, to answer them. I don't. Uh, can you just repeat that last sentence? We've taken in how much in investment income over the uh, budget? So far this year, we've taken in over $5 million, and we still have to report. We haven't reported April yet, so we're, this is only through the end of March. We've taken in over $5 million in interest income, investment income, uh, in the general fund alone, um, and uh, the budget was uh, $600,000, as I recall. So, And that's the period of this fiscal year? That's this fiscal year. That's fiscal year Through March. Through March, so there's still five million dollars over a budget of six hundred thousand. Yeah, and there's still another um, three months left to record to earn interest income. So, at the highest rates in many many years. So, so it's not because of anything I've done. It's really just that's the market. Um, so that's um, so that that's sort of our first outcome. Uh, the other outcome that we have. Um, been trying to focus on is I mentioned I mentioned a little bit earlier technology. We've worked with the IT department uh, in the implement and the ISD and many of the other permitting authorities in the implementation of this new Gov Open Gov system um, that allows online permitting, online licensing, allows allows um, you know the um, people to apply for these permits on the web and um, and then they end up paying for this. These services online as well. And that changed a lot, like I mentioned earlier, changed a lot about how we take in money. So we've worked with the IT department and we've worked with the permitting agencies to, um, to make sure we incorporate it into, into this system um, online ways and automated ways of taking in all of this revenue so that essentially every day we get a download file that we import into the system. And that replaced a lot of people having to, you know, hand, not hand type, but hand prepare um, manual schedules and turn paper over to our office and us having to enter that into Munis. That's all done, that's all done automatically now um, through, the, through the use of import files and the like. And we also automated a lot of the way that, a lot of the ways that uh, money uh, was taken in through the City Hall Systems uh, website. The City Hall Systems website is used for things like people that want to order birth certificates online or uh, marriage certificates online or um, uh, bulky waste items, uh, mattress, the new mattress program. A lot of those are ordered uh, through the online system. And we take that money in now electronically, which again, eliminated the use of a lot of schedules that were being prepared by city staff in the past. So so, um, so a lot of that, tech, a lot of those changes in technology have led uh, to us not needing that FTE. So that's that's hence the reason we deferred that FTE uh, for, at this time, in this in the fiscal twenty four budget, uh, some of the other um, I'll just touch on some of the other outcomes that we have uh, that we're um, seeking funding for in this budget is um, a lot of the uh, professional development that we do in our office. Uh, in the past, the Treasury Department used to be more focused on it used to be more of a bookkeeping function uh, where money was taken in, accounted for, and and reported out. Um, it's really turned into more of an analytical department. So there's a lot of, you know, managing these systems requires a lot of analytical skills and the laws have become more complex in terms of managing a lot of these responsibilities. So, so we have to engage in continuing education. Our assistant treasurer just recently became certified. She passed the exam to get certified uh, with the Mass Collectors and Treasurers Association as both an assistant treasurer and an assistant collector. Our assistant collector is um, working towards that certification and also took part in the MMA's leadership um, uh, uh, seminar that that they that the MMA has recently put on. And I've actually started teaching courses in a lot of these programs. So a lot of that has, um, it really helps raise the bar for, for what we do and how we do it and raises the level of professionalism um, in terms of what we do in, in the Treasury Department. And then, and then finally, you know, just one little sort of um, other thing that we're looking at is uh, managing uncashed checks, tailings. We call them tailings in the office. But what that really is, is when, um, when we issue all these checks to people, um, you know, vendor checks, payroll checks, um, a lot of times they don't cash them. Who knows why they don't cash them? 
but they they don't cash them and then eventually they just become these stale um old checks that we then have to chase people to cash them um a couple of ways that we're trying to mitigate that are obviously in payroll with direct deposit um we have uh, most of our employees both school and city side are now on direct deposit on the vendor side we have implemented a new program um it's called pay mode x and uh, what we are doing with pay mode X is we are slowly enrolling. We started this rolling out this program in February, but what we're doing is slowly enrolling all of our vendors, prioritizing on the high dollar vendors first and the high volume vendors first. Uh, but we're getting them into a point where they get paid electronically as well. Um, and just to give you a little bit of uh, background information on the success of pay mode X in February, we were virtually 100% paper checks. Um, by the end of March, we were about 70-30. In terms of dollars, 70% of our dollars are going out on paper checks, 30% were going out on uh, electronically, either by direct deposit or through a card program. And now we're at a point where it's 55-45. So 55% of our dollars in the last 30 days went out on paper checks and 45% went out electronically. So we're seeing this fast ramp up of getting our vendors to be receive their payments um, electronically as opposed to uh, through paper checks, which improves security, it's more efficient, um, and um, and it, it just uh, has incre increased not only our operations, but from the vendor's perspective, they get paid faster. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean we front the money any um, faster as well. So uh, those are the things that we are focusing on. And um, and if there are any questions, that that's largely what I have to say. The other big part of the budget is obviously debt service, uh, which um, I won't say it is what it is, but I guess for, to a certain extent, it, it is what it is. Um, we've incurred all that debt, and those are the, the debt payments. Um, there's a long list of those projects there. So uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Kalis and Councillor Gentile. Thank you, Mr. Mendez. Uh, this is actually a question from Ms. Lemieux. Um, so at what point does deferral mean elimination or transfer that position to another department where it's more ne needed? Um, oftentimes, um, as I think you know, and you may not know the percentage, but 83% of our employee base um, are in unions. And so when we feel that technology um, has advanced to a, a place where we may not need a position, we can't just eliminate positions. And so we defer them uh, while we are uh, discussing with our unions how we may want to restructure and go forward. So uh, we find any of the deferrals that we talk about uh, should be funded for a dollar in the book so we don't eliminate the positions until we've certainly worked um, through that entire conversation with our unions. Thank you. Councilor Gentile. Thanks. Um, so Ron, I, I just wanted, I meant to actually contact you outside of this meeting and I apologize, but um, we in our financial guidelines, we have some pretty definitive uh, ways that we are supposed to control where our money is based on the strength of the bank and a certain rating system. I'm mm -hmm. sure I'm sure that you know that and you've got your what is it red, green, yellow, whatever. Mm -hmm. but we're paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I look at that all the time and I, I know what goes into um, a green rating versus a yellow rating and three stars versus two stars. So I actually do monitor the, the reports that come out. So I'll generally know beforehand whether or not a bank is, um, you know, in danger of, of changing. Um, so, so I do monitor that all the time. And, um, and as far as the requirements, I know that we have uh, capitalization requirements. For example, um, we won't have any more than 15% of a bank's equity in any one particular bank. And that in some cases, if a bank is smaller, might drive um, the limit to how much we might put in any particular bank. Um, because I'm sure the city doesn't wanna be in a position where we're such a large deposit or in a bank that us moving our money might um, send the bank into a, 
uh, difficult situation. So, so um, I'm uh, I'm pleased to hear that because it was a few it was several years ago that a very strong bank in this region. In the the fact was, it was kind of like a uh, an anomaly what happened, and all in there rating got dropped from you know the top tier to the second tier whatever and then our guidelines required that we had to shift a lot of money and uh it was it uh this was before you obviously mm -hmm. became treasurer and it made a lot of work from the for the treasurer but um i think that it's you know important um you know to keep an eye on that mm -hmm. um we you know we have to follow the rating system and if we have to move money we have to move money or you're a fresh face and if you thought that it's a, it's too restrictive and we have to go through all this moving of money and we truly didn't really do anybody any favors as far as keeping it safe we need to know that too because i know how much work um treasurer Ridden had to go through to shift everything so you know, I'd be interested in what you think about that. Um, and yeah, the yeah. last thing I just want to ask you about, um, as far as investments, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a few questions because you made a sizable change uh, from, you know, where we had our money invested to, I think, some T-bills and so forth. Mm -hmm. And if if I read your response right, the numbers have actually, you made a good move. I, I never, I didn't question, I'm not smart enough to know if it was a good move or not. I've always had these reservations about any one person, and that happens to be the treasurer, according to state law, only has the authority to move money. I've never thought that that was a good idea. So it's nothing about you personally. Mm -hmm. um, I've always questioned why why wouldn't you make sure that there were other people um that work you know that are involved in the decision making of how you move millions of dollars but that's a story for another day um so i had asked you about moving i think a bunch of money you ended up moving to t-bills and i think that it's proven to be um a pretty wise move and the only other point i'll make is the news that your investment income has grown from 600,000 to 5 million is absolutely phenomenal. And you're probably going to describe that now. And I just want to say that, you know, I've been trying to say that overall, we have, haven't even had a discussion about overlay surplus yet, that overall, you know, the city, at least from a, from a cash standpoint, has been, is, is in a, pretty healthy situation right now. And I'll leave it at that. And um, I, I'm, I'm more interested in what you have to say, Ron. So, um, lost my train of thought, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we, um, I, I look at the, um, you know, as far as the, the moving of the money is concerned, um, what I try to do is not keep most of the money in one place or another, um, because diversification is obviously important, but also sometimes MMDT does very well. Right now we're in a market where a money market account like MMDT, a money market mutual fund like MMDT is performing very well. So we shift a lot of the money there. When we went back about a year, it was probably made more sense to have them in banks where they lagged behind interest rates. Um, as far as T-bills and treasuries are concerned, the, the one thing I wanted to do was just make sure we can say that we have that much of that money that is um, that is pretty much um, in terms of safety and security in the safest investment that it could be in, notwithstanding what you might see on the, the news um, hour um, the last few days or the last few weeks. The U.S. treasuries are still the safest investment um, that you could put money into. Um, whereas MMDT doesn't have any security, although it is um, uh, to a certain extent a state managed money market fund. And if something went wrong with MMDT, it wouldn't just be a Newton problem, it would be a Massachusetts wide problem. But the way it's invested is 
is certainly safe and sound, but that doesn't mean that we don't diversify. So I try to keep, you know, try to keep uh, things diversified. Um, I also try to avoid any of our banking operations to be in one specific bank or another. So we deposit money into the Village Bank. We have electronic fund money come into Unibank. We write checks off of Eastern Bank. So we we move money between banks and between funds all the time. Um, and so that that might explain why I, I didn't think moving $20 million or $60 million was that big of a decision because I'm moving that kind of money all the time between different banks uh, just to fund our operations. And because we don't have all our money in one place, we have it in these multiple different um, uh, locations. So so that that's, those are sort of my thoughts. I'm, I'm not sure if there was a specific question that I may have not answered, but. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Humphrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just on this point we've just been talking about in terms of uh, investment income. I was just trying to get a better sense in terms of the uh, apples to apples and year over year and that kind of thing. Is that uh, uh, the the amount that that we were just talking about is that net or is that just not factoring in other things that have gone up on the other side of the balance sheet for the city? You mean the the roughly five million dollars the investment income number? Yeah, well, I'm just, just thinking because like that you know there's there's some aspects where high interest rates makes us a bunch of money and there's some things where we're having to spend more money because of high interest rates. So I'm trying to get a sense of how that's balancing out overall. Yeah, that's not looking at uh, spending money for with higher interest. Well, we haven't really experienced on the spending side. That would be basically bonding debt, and uh, as more as Ms. Lemieux indicated earlier, we the latest debt issuance we got was two point nine three percent, which is a very low rate. But um, so we haven't experienced necessarily the increasing interest rates of impacting us on the on the borrowing side. We probably will next year. But that hasn't happened yet. Um, but on the revenue side, we certainly are experiencing that uh, because it's in real time as interest rates are going up by having a lot of the money that we have in places like MMDT and, and buying treasuries, which grabs the, the current interest rate right, you know, as it's coming out. Um, we're riding that market as it goes up. So so that's um that that's been our experience. Now, obviously, I know you can't um sort of predict what's going to happen in the future but i am just trying to get a sense of like do we think that's a that the five million is an unusual blip or that if the things were to continue in a similar yeah. vein to how they have been that that would start to be a longer term thing yeah i mean it probably is a blip um just because i think the uh, and i'll put my bad prognostication hat on, but it sounds like the Fed does, isn't going to increase rates the next time. That doesn't mean they won't, but it means the indications they're giving is that they're probably leveling off the interest rates increases, which means they probably think the economy is heading into some kind of recession. So we probably will see if the recession starts to hit, then they're going to do the opposite and start bringing interest rates down again. Nobody, nobody that I've spoken to thinks that interest rates will go back to where they were before, like a year right. or so ago. But we're probably as high as they're going to get. And they may, you know, at some point level off and start to come back down again. But it all depends on what happens in the economy. So uh, as you said, um, there's there's really no way of predicting. Now, apart from moving things into the the T-bills, as we talked about, was mm -hmm. there anything else that was a significant change in in the investment strategy that led to that, or was it just of the fact that the interest rates went up? It was really, yeah, interest rates were going up. And I wanted, because when you buy T-bills, because we're limited to one year, um, we're limited to 12 month uh, instruments, US right. government obligations for the general fund and 24 months for the stabilization fund. So I just wanted to grab those, you know, now that we're kind of at the higher end uh, of the of interest rates and we can, and we grab them, we grab those rates and we lock them in for the year and the or the or potentially the 24 months, um, and we'll keep locking them in if interest rates go up. But if interest rates starts to level off or come down again, then we might start rolling back out of them and moving money and move money back over to MMDT, which might be a little slower. 
because they're buying securities and holding them for a longer period of time. So they're probably going to be a little slower if interest rates do level off and start going down. Um, but the other the other big thing was just basically moving money out of banks because banks always lag behind the market. So they lag behind the market when interest rates go down and they lag behind the market when interest rates go up. So you don't want to be in a bank money market account with interest rates going up because banks are going to take, you know, six to nine months to increase their rates. So, um, so that was okay. the other big move. It was really moving money from a lot of the banks and into um, MMDT and into, into these uh, uh, T-bills. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Lemieux, I had several follow-up questions from, from your office's perspective on this. So I guess the first one is with that, extra sort of boost to the investment income how did you factor that in in terms of budgeting where where did we decide this year to put that um thank thank you very much i actually that was why i raised my hand whenever this conversation ended i wanted to make sure that you know as a finance committee <clears throat> excuse me you all understood what we were projecting or budgeting for next year. Um, and so just to put it all in perspective, in the last 13 years, we have had one year, one year out of 13 where we earned $3 million in interest, one year where we earned $2 million in interest, and one year where we earned, uh, I think it was around a million four. The other 10 out of the last 13 years, uh, we've earned less than a million dollars a year in interest. So we have to make sure that we stay conservative. However, we are having such, you know, we know that rates aren't going to completely drop off. Uh, so for next year, we ended up budgeting uh, two and a half million. So which is still, you know, a fairly strong um, number for us. Uh, but I think something that um, is is definitely attainable, especially uh, with the with the Fed's not lowering rates, um, even at least through, you know, now. Okay, and so the two and a half million that you used this year was that? Did that go toward any pr specific thing, or was it just sort of spreading it around, you know, to everything? So no, so none of it. Uh, really does. It's all in the growth. Um, we had within our revenue uh, projections, um, uh, meter revenues are down still. They have not recovered as that, you know, to back what to what they were in pre-pandemic levels. We have traffic violations have not come back to pre-pandemic levels. Our rooms taxes um, you know, certainly in the near term, we don't think those will come back because the hotel Indigo closed. So within all of the revenue budgets, um, you know, there are some things that went up, uh, some things that went down. So there isn't, uh, for the most part, we don't tie uh, any initiatives that we're going to do. I try to calculate what the revenue is going to be in total. And then we look at every program um, and every uh, type of expenditure that we may want to support. Um, you know, we have each of those stand on their own merits. Okay, great. So now all in, does that mean we're still at what something around 3.7% growth? Is that what I remember hearing from the, the speech? Oh. Like my, my, the reason I'm asking um, that is just that that's kind of roughly where it had been. And that's, you know, sort of the, or, you know, the three and a half, 3.7 range. I'm trying to get a sense of if this is all, all in when you factor in things that went down elsewhere and this boost, mm -hmm. did we come out ahead or come out basically even? Because I don't want the public to be left with the impression that we're way ahead if in fact it just sort of patched over some other things that were not as good this year. I, I would say we, have, we are not way ahead. Um, we are probably a little ahead. Um, and that and and what will happen is that money will drop to free cash. Um, but okay. even things like the ARPA funds that we've used in fiscal 22, we budgeted 4.6 million. In fiscal 23, we took 3 million. In fiscal 24, we took 2 million. Next year, our plan is to take something close to 1 million. So we're creating, if you will, our own negative um, revenue stream that we almost have to make up by these other things coming back. 
Um, so there's just a lot of movement in what ends up being, um, you know, less than 10% of our budget. Uh, so the good news is because we're so dependent on property taxes, there's, you know, there's always a, a, a pro and a con to everything um, because we are so heavily dependent on property taxes, that part of our revenue stream really doesn't fluctuate at all. So we really have a very small portion that has fluctuated, uh, especially over these past few years. Right. Now, a moment ago, Mr. Mendez was citing the interest rates that we had gotten and I know that came up in the previous meeting discussion that we had as well on the on the uh, borrowing side, the bonding side. Mm -hmm. So what was that? It was two point. What did you say? Two point, Seven. Two point nine three. Two point nine three. And you know, to that extent, I guess we're still coming out ahead in that the interest rates that we're borrowing at are still lower than our uh, revenue growth rate, which is what you want to see because then your, you know, your revenues are going to grow faster and you'll come out ahead by bonding rather than by spending in the here and now, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know that. But uh, am I correct in remembering that right before all the big changes that happened, so not only the interest rates, but the pandemic and everything, that the beginning of 2020, when we were still in person having these meetings, there was a bond issue that happened where it was almost 0%. Am I misremembering that? It was very, very, very low in that there were a whole bunch of people, uh, entities, institutional investors bidding against each other at auction for our bonds, right? Uh, well, we always have. Uh, in this past January, I think we had 10 bidders. Um, mm -hmm. You know, So we always do very good. Uh, getting bids for our bonds. Um, I don't recall what the lowest interest rate was that we got. The one that was almost nothing, I actually believe was, uh, we only have, we've only ever sold one ban, a bond anticipation note since I have been here. And I think it was probably our ban that was um, extremely low okay. and that and all we pay on that is six months of interest and then we convert it to a bond the following year which is something that we always will keep in our back pockets as a strategy so if we say that you know next january the interest rates are through the roof we would very possibly sell bands instead of bonds um so if if we thought that the market was going to uh decline if if we don't think it's going down, there's no point in doing that. But right, if we right. think it's going down, it makes sense. So I'm, um, you know, I'm not obviously I'm not going to rehash here. Like my personal opinion is that the city should have borrowed more money back at you know uh, 2020 and the years leading up to that. And I felt that way at the time, not just as a matter of hindsight, but I'm not going to you know dwell on that too long. But just to say that, like, yes the AAA bond rating and uh, everything else that we've done to get in a good position to get the best possible deal on the market that we can for the interest rates means that our 2.9 whatever percent borrowing rate is pretty good, all things considered, but it's not as good as it had been, which again, means that our costs are going up for things, right? right. And so again, That's I just correct. want, I want to underscore that point as well, because again, I don't want anyone to have, you know, to come away with the impression that, you know, everything's great. It's boom times. We're fine on the finances. When in reality, a lot of our costs have been going up, even if they're still being controlled and relatively low compared to other things. There's a whole bunch of stuff here that we're having to spend more money on, including our borrowing costs, even if we're also making some additional money uh, this past fiscal year on the other side of interest rates being high. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Okay. Um, Ms. Lemieux, you still have your hand up. Did you have? I, I, it shouldn't be. Okay. Councilor Kalis, then Gentile. Oh, sorry. I, that shouldn't be up. Okay. Councilor Gentile. So I agree with what the uh, Councilor Humphrey was just getting into, which is, you know, the amount of money that we borrow and we borrowed an awful lot at a very low interest rate a lot of years ago, and I, we probably, you know, didn't anticipate what was going to happen now as far as cash. But it's still not a bad idea because we just get much more favorable rates than the person that goes in to, you know, get a regular mortgage. So 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, discount borrowing some money to get some things done that we uh, we feel that we need to get done. Um, as far as I want to also go back to something that um, Council Humphrey got into, which you know was talking about the interest income, and I I just want to make it clear, and somebody can correct me. In the 2023 budget, um, we had budgeted six hundred thousand dollars, and the treasurer, I think happily told us, and rightfully so, that we're on track to um, have investment income around $5 million. I'm just looking at my notes. So I want to make, I want to make sure. All right, well, $5 million through March, north of that by the time we get through the end of the fiscal year. Well, thank you. Thank you for helping me make my point. Um, it's a valid point. <laughs> So it, it's true. I heard somebody say it was a huge blip, um, and I I wouldn't want to you know predict that that blip is going to sustain itself. But you know it's not going down to one percent anytime soon. We lived with, I mean, our personally, we all lived with you know like if you just kept money in your checking account, it was what half a point, <laughs> one half of one percent. Um, so you know, but. It, you know, we had a blip, it went up, and, and thankfully it's happened for us. And um, I, I'll be curious to know what we're using for a percentage rate, um, you know, in this year's budget, um, because that's going to be kind of important going forward. It certainly can't be 4.5%, 5.21, which was in an earlier email. Great job by the treasurer. Um, but we don't need to be using 1% either. So I, I actually don't know the answer to the question, but I'll be interested in seeing. Uh, Mr. Mendez, any further comments or reactions to anything that was said? And then otherwise, I want to ask for a motion on this budget. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, no, as far as investment income is concerned, I think uh, I think this year we're budgeted, at, as uh, Ms. Lemieux said, at about uh, $2.5 million, which is reasonable given that we don't think interest rates are going to stay at these levels. Uh, they're probably going to come down um, as the economy changes. Uh, so, it, so it's certainly a, a prudent uh, conservative approach to do that. And um, and um, I guess that's those are the only comments I have. Um, but what's the rate, Ron, that we're budgeting? Can oh, the rate that we're budgeting? Uh, I'm not sure that we, do we have a rate that I didn't, uh, Councilor Gentile, I didn't really use a rate. Uh, it was more a total dollar. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the only time we've exceeded it was uh, in fiscal 20, fiscal 2020 which, is the which, only uh, time uh, in 13 years that we've gotten more than two and a half million. So, but back in 2020 and for the last four or five years, we've all been sitting getting interest as I said earlier on a like a basic checking account at one percent and so now we're in a much better period and that's good and all I'm saying is if we we need we need to have the number that we're budgeting in terms of a percentage not the bottom line dollar amount just so you know because if we're using one percent or one and a half percent I don't think that's representative of where we're going to be over the next year in terms of interest income I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, do we have a motion on this budget? A motion for a straw vote. A vote to approve motion. Okay. Um, any other discussion before we vote on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? I'll abstain. Okay, one abstention. So um, I don't know what our total is now. I think it's five in favor, no opposed, one abstention. Is that right, Madam yeah. Clerk? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, very good. Treasurer Mendez, thank you. Really appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, have a good rest of your evening. 
we're going to go on to the purchasing department. Mr. Reed, thank you so much for your patience, and we would love to hear from you about your department's budget. I've learned so much tonight. Um, <laughs> Keep I coming will... back. You will. Uh, <laughs> your knowledge will grow over time. <laughs> I did just buy a CD that's paying 4.75%. So at Cambridge Savings Bank. So rates are significantly higher than they used to be. Um, I also wanted to uh, address something that came up earlier, which is uh, about contracts. Uh, a lot of the paving and construction contracts are so-called unit price contracts where bidders bid on estimated uh, quantities of tar, gravel, whatever. Um, and uh, it's worth a little bitter, but then we can we can do as much or as little work as long as the unit prices stay the same. So it gives the city a great deal of flexibility uh, in the contract uh, to be able to uh, adjust the actual amount of work that's done under a contract. Anyway, um, so um, the purchasing department doesn't really have a lot of complex financial uh, issues to deal with. It's a small department. There are five of us. Uh, I am responsible for. Uh, the purchasing department, the mailroom, and the print shop. And uh, all of us do a little bit of everything um, between those jobs. The purchasing department uh, does about um, $50 million a year in purchases, about 20 in purchase orders, and about 30 in bids. Um, we also uh, um, kind of manage a kids program. The kids uh, from the high school uh, deliver mail in City Hall. And that's a program that uh, we support. Uh, the mayor's office supports as well. Um, um, I uh, administer the city's credit card for the departments. Departments that need to use the credit card can come to us. Um, we um, make charges and keep track of the uh, charges that are made. And uh, I'm a lawyer by training. So when legal issues come up, uh, I do the first tier, first tier legal work, but then it sometimes has to go to the uh, law department. Our budget is um, pretty, our discretionary income is uh, pretty small. It's about, uh, it's about, it's less than $20,000 on the uh, purchasing side. And it's only about $8,000 on the print shop side. The uh, rest of the money is committed to salaries or long-term leases on equipment. Uh, we have a lot of equipment down in the print shop. Um, so, um, you can shave a little here and there, but uh, um, basically the uh, the financial budget is set. I do have to say that uh, unlike some other departments, I have a absolutely fantastic group of people that work for me. They're very competent, they're very loyal, and they've been they've been there pretty much as long as I've been there. And uh, so it's a very stable department. Uh, and the quality of work is very good. Um, we uh, interact with virtually every city department. And uh, um, we are one of those departments, I think. <laughs> I don't know if this is us or whatever, but we're the department that uh, people often go to when they don't know where else to go. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, I think, maybe a function of the fact that we are doing everything, all kinds of different things for different departments. Anyway, um, financially, I don't think there's a lot that uh, I can tell you, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about our operations. Okay, thank you. We've got Councillor Gentile and Councillor Humphrey. Councillor Gentile, did you want to go first? My, uh, my hand was up from earlier, so I... Oh, okay. Let Sorry about that. Councillor Humphrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Reed, thank you for being here. Uh, I know this is the same topic that I brought up the last several years, but uh, unfortunately, it came up in a different department's budget discussion the other night, uh, which is the issue of prison labor in the procurement process. So, and I know that uh, Councillor Noel is under the weather tonight, so she's not here with us, but uh, she, you know, shares my view on this as well. Uh, and I know there are some other councillors who do too. I know that under state law, there are certain aspects which we don't 
don't have flexibility on, right? If it's, you have to, you know, if it's a bid and it's the lowest bid, you have to go with that. And in many cases, you are sort of required by the state law to go with that as, as your source of, uh, uh, on a particular contract. However, I would, I would like to, and I guess this isn't necessarily a question tonight, cause I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but I don't know how much there is in terms of spending that the city is doing where there is some flexibility there right and the flexibility point has certainly come up in the discussions about equity and inclusion and so forth but i think that some of us would be interested in having a requirement that says that in cases where it's not required by state law that the city is not allowed to use that as a source of procurement so i don't know if that's an option i don't know if that's even a significant share of spending at that point because probably Yo. it's probably required to the extent that we do it but um i just wanted to bring it up again i know i brought it up the last several years in the budget process but it's on our minds again i assume you're talking about mass core yes okay can you, um, can you, wait, before you go can you be, just be clear on what you're asking because i don't even understand your question you uh, if i can paraphrase it uh there's the the state department of corrections has a program where uh, prisoners uh, in jails have uh, earned money by producing things. I, I, the things that I know of are they embroider jackets and things like that. That that those are from Mass Corps. And I think the question is, and our, also our business cards as city councilors and things like that. A lot of the office supply type things. Oh, I, I, well, I well as far as the low bid goes. Um, the uh, we've never put out something where Mass Corps has been a bidder, so that's not really an issue. I think that any any uh, purchases through Mass Corps, which is exempt because it's a state agency, uh, are of are rather small uh, purchase orders, uh, probably for like business cards or uh, sweatshirts or you know a lot of departments have uh, jackets that are monogrammed and things like that uh, that would become that they do, but. Um, I don't, I've talked to the people from Mass Corps and I guess, um, I guess it depends who you believe, but, um, they say that their people are compensated for the work that they do. Yeah. Uh, they, they get paid less than a dollar an hour for that work. Okay. And, and Mass Corps does not, uh, charge that low of an amount to the people that are buying from them. So they are making a significant amount of money. And of course those people, to the extent that they're gaining any work skills, they're not, you know, building up savings or whatever. They aren't even making enough money to do their prison phone calls and well, that kind what of thing. did I so, tell you last year? Well, I think you, I think, you know, I think in, in previous years when we had raised this, you just yeah. said that, you know, you were following the, the state rules on, right. on the procurement process and so forth. And and like you just said, I, I think it is a relatively small uh, amount of purchasing, uh, oh, but yes. it was it was floated in this meeting at programs and services the other night that we should be doing more purchasing from mass core. And this did not sit well with a number of the city councilors who believe that the prison labor system, in addition to being inherently racialized and exploitative, uh, is also undercutting the broader economy of, you know, good union jobs and everybody else that's working at a normal wage. Well, I mean, they're getting training too. It's not just a question of the money, but I guess, I don't. I don't think you should make too big a uh, deal out of this because I think the purchases uh, that are made through MassCore are very modest. Uh, I mean, be happy to track them if you like. I mean, that would be a, be a fairly easy matter to find out uh, how many wrecks we've done for through MassCore for whatever period, a couple of years or whatever, and just so you could see factually, is that would that be helpful? I don't know. Yeah, well, as I said, I'm happy to have a further discussion about it later. I just was bringing it up tonight because it did come up the other night in a different department's budget discussion. Yep. So thank you. Councillor Gentile, then Kalis. I'm all set. Thank you. Councillor Kalis, all set. Yeah, I don't know why it keeps going on. <laughs> it's just one of those nights. <laughs> Um, okay. Do we have further comments or questions for Mr. Reed? Do we have a, or do we have a motion for a straw vote on his department's budget? One quick question. Yes, Councilor Johnson. Mr. Reed, Nick, Nick, when, um, 
I know you handle, you review all contracts and so forth. Once the original contract goes through, um, and then, the, you know, the job starts and, uh, you know, the job get, gets um, completed. Uh, I'm more interested once you've, you know, looked at the contract and said that it's okay. What role did, um, does your department play after that, if any? Um, we don't do contract administration. That's done by the departments. But if there's any extension or amendment or uh, change order or something like that, we would do it. But uh, if, if the department's really in the best position to interact with the uh, contractor or vendor to assure performance of the contract. Is, is that your question? Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's everything. Do we have a motion on the purchasing department's budget? Approve. That was a motion to approve and a straw vote, Councilor Humphrey? Yes. Okay. Any discussion on Councilor Humphrey's motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Reed. I appreciate that the hour is late and you were very patient. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we need overall, because that concludes uh, the budget portion, maybe just a motion to hold on these three items, 1-23, 1-23 subparents 3, 1-23 subparents 4. So Is there a motion? Moved. So okay. moved. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, so at this time, we have the last two items before us, 151-23 and 152-23. Um, give me one second here because I have some comments to make with respect to executive session. Madam Chair, can yes. we take a uh, two or three minute break? <laughs> sure, Mo motion for a two to three minute break. All those in favor, please say aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Let's take a two to three minute break. Uh, we'll be right back. Let's come back at 10 15. It's 10 11. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, folks, ready when you are. Okay, I think uh, enough of us are are back to get going here. So, so I'm down to cheese its. Um, <laughs> I have Jolly Rancher gummies. I'm gonna try not to chew too much in your ears while I do this. <laughs> this is making me remember that uh, one of the benefits when we get to budget time of being in person was that our clerk always provided us with lots of candy. It was always very useful getting to this hour and having yeah, them pick me I, up. Our clerk should be sending that to us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we are back from recess. We have items 151-23 and 152-23 before us. Uh, the first is the appropriation request for $55,000 for the full and final settlement of Allison Larkin against the city of Newton. The other is to appropriate $525,000 for the full and final settle settlement of John Doe, Jane Doe, and David Doe against the Newton Public Schools. Um, okay. I want to suggest that uh, we go into an executive session and that that is my intent at this time. The purpose of the executive session is to discuss strategy with respect to litigation matters, the first being Allison Larkin against the city of Newton pending in Worcester Superior Court, and the second being John Doe, Jane Doe, and David Doe against the Newton Public Schools pending in the United States District Court because discussing the matters in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Executive sessions are closed to the public, and the committee will not reconvene in an open session. Uh, I would like to request a roll call vote to enter into an executive session in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Sections 21, Subparens A, Subparens 3, to, dis to discuss strategy um, with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll as to uh, this question? Yes. Councillor Gentile. Aye. Councillor Humphrey. Aye. Councillor Kalis. Aye. Councillor Malachy. Aye. Councillor Noel. Councillor Norton. Councillor Oliver. Aye. Chair Grossman. Aye. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. At this time, the clerk will email counselors and the appropriate city staff the meeting link for the executive session. Uh, as I stated, this meeting will not be reconvening in open session um, and uh, appreciate uh, all those who are watching your participation tonight. Uh, we'll, counselors, I'll see you in executive session.